Arrives, councilors. I'm going to call the special hearing of the Brockton City Council uh, to order relative to the budget. If you could please stand and salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you. I'm Robert Sullivan, the City Councilor at Large, Council President for this year. I want to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, this is one of the process uh, to begin the, uh, the budget. At 6.30 tonight, we're going to be starting the, the budget, which is this big binder here and the school budget as well that the mayor and the CFO has presented to the city council. Just please bear in mind that the city council, under the charter form of government here in the city of Brockton, with the legislative branch, we cannot add to the budget. The only thing we can do relative to the budget is cut from the budget, accept the budget, reject the budget. If we cut from the budget, we can't earmark funds. What we do is it goes into the general fund. We can make a, uh, a, uh, a courtesy recommendation to the mayor as is his role as the CEO administrator of the city of Brockton. But again, it would be the mayor's duty and uh, obligation and decision on where that money would go once it's cut, if it is cut, and put into the general fund. With that being said, I'm joined by my colleagues. We're gonna take a roll call vote. Uh, starting from down there, please state your name. Dennis Neary, City Council Award 3. Paul Studensky, City Council, Award 4. Shirley Azak, Ward 7, City Council. Shana Barnes, at large. Dennis Denapoli, Ward 5. Moses Rodriguez, uh, at large. Thank you, Councilors, and I'm sure we will be joined by our other fellow colleagues as well. Under the, uh, the auspices of a special uh, hearing, this is exactly what it is. It's the public's opportunity to come before us and state your thoughts, uh, whatever you want to talk about, but it has to be specific and relative to the budget because that's why we're here and that's what the public notice was. If you do want to come because the public hearing was open, I'm going to ask you to please do it in an orderly fashion. You'd come forward, you'd state your name to the clerk, and then you can state what's on your mind relative to the budget. So with that being said, if there is anybody here that would like to address the City Council as we sit tonight, uh, please come forward and, uh, and, and do so. Is there anyone here that would like to, uh, to talk about the budget fiscal year 2015 to the City Council? Hey, Mike. That's the second time. Anyone else, third and final time, relative to coming forward and, uh, and talking favorably about the budget or anything about the budget? That's good. Is there anyone here in opposition relative to the budget? Does anyone want to come before us talk in a negative fashion opposition-wise? Is there anybody at all that wants to come up and say hello to us? <laughs> anybody alive? <laughs> Ma'am, please come up, state your name for the clerk, please. You come right to the podium. Right over there. At the lectern. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us. If you could state your name for the clerk, please. Uh, my name is Amy Stubblefield. I'm an ESL teacher. Amy Stubblefield. Thank you. I'm an ESL teacher at the Raymond, the Raymond. and I'm concerned about the cuts um, specifically to the ESL and bilingual department, especially um, one of, I'm just, I'm just gonna say that I'm concerned. Um, the, the, it's an essential service that we provide, and it's, the cuts are really gonna have an impact on the service that we can continue to provide to our English language learners. So that is my concern. Thank, Thank you very much, ma'am. We appreciate you being here, taking the time. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that would like to come before and address the council relative to the fiscal year 2015 budget? I'm gonna take a two minute recess because it looks like there's quite a few people out there that are gonna be joining us. We're gonna take a two minute recess.
Back into session relative to the City Council special meeting for the sole purpose of discussing the fiscal year 2015 budget. Uh, as I said previously, uh, the budget has been presented. We will be getting uh, our budget process tonight at 6.30, scheduled for the 9th, the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th if needed. Uh, if anybody would like to come forward to talk about the budget, now is your opportunity. Is anyone here that would like to talk about the budget to your elected officials being the legislative branch of City Council? If not, I'm going to entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Motion to close. Second. Second. Motion was made and properly seconded to close the, uh, the special hearing. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. We're going to close the special uh, hearing right now. Time having arrived, 6.30 on Monday, June 9th. I hereby call the budget hearing, fiscal year 2015, to order. Councilor Stadinsky. David, if I might, I have two motions. The first motion would be that the members of the City Council be allowed to work in shirt sleeves if they need to due to the very, very warm weather. Second. Motion made properly second. And you know what? As the President, I'm going to agree to that, Council. We're not even going to take a vote. You're good. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The second motion will be to move number nine to number one due to the weather again and the fact of who number nine is. The number nine is the uh, Council on Aging agenda item. While those folks here. Motion was made by Councilor Stanisky. Is there a second? second? Motion made properly seconded. We're going to take number nine out of order. Before we do that, again, I just want to explain the process to everybody here. As a City Council President, tonight we're sitting as a Finance Committee, so all of us sit on the Finance Committee. I serve as the Chair in that capacity. We're having the budget hearings. They're going to begin tonight, tomorrow night. We're going to have them on Wednesday night. We may come in on Thursday if need be. I've been on the Council nine years. We've done that a few times. The purpose of this uh, budget hearing is to go over the agenda, that the budget that has been submitted to the City Council, the legislative body, by the Mayor, and his collaboration with the CFO, Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Condon. The budget has been presented. It is the mayor's budget. Please bear in mind that the city council, when we sit as budget uh, hearings, we are able to cut from the budget. We're able to approve the budget, reject the budget. However, we cannot add to the budget. I think this is a misnomer. Some people have said to me, Councilor Sullivan, you can add to the budget. Under the law, we are not allowed to add to the budget. It is not our budget the budget that's been presented to the legislative body, the City Council. So we can only address what is before us tonight in the, in the, uh, in the purview of the Mayor vis-a-vis vis -vis the budget that's presented for fiscal year 2015. If we do make cuts, ladies and gentlemen, please bear in mind again, we cannot earmark, meaning we cannot cut from one department and say this money goes to this department. We're barred by law to do that as well. The only thing that we can do if we do cut, I'm not saying that we are, but if we did cut as a collective body, because we would have to take a vote on those cuts through the uh, parliamentary procedure of a motion, uh, anything that is cut goes into the general fund. We, as a legislative body the City Council, can respectfully ask the CEO, the Administrator for the City of Brockton, the Mayor, a slight recommendation of where we would like to see that money go. However, again, bear in mind, under the Charter form of Government, the Mayor, and only the Mayor, can decide where the money that goes into the General Fund can go. I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that, because I got a lot of calls today and this week, and I appreciate those calls. But from an educational standpoint, that's the only thing that the City Council can do. We look at the budget that's presented to us. We either accept it, reject it, or make cuts to it. And again, we take a vote. We're going to have four nights. I suspect that the vote will come down favorably or unfavorably, depending on how the, the will of the council, for the 16th, which again, we're going to be sitting as Finance Committee on Monday the 16th, and then on the 23rd, we would take, hopefully, a vote if we choose to do that, which would be a full city council vote on the 23rd, and again, it would either ratify or reject the budget, one or the other. I hope everybody's clear on that. Again, the City Council is made up of three new colleagues, three very talented individuals, and I just want to make sure that everybody is crystal clear. A motion was made, it was properly seconded to take agenda item number nine, Council on Aging, out of order. It was a favorable recommendation. We took a majority vote on that. Madam Clerk, please uh, read number nine. Council on Aging, Janice Fitzgerald, Director. Ms. Fitzgerald, good evening. Good evening, Councillors. How, How are you tonight? Good. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you might, we're having trouble hearing. Can we close that door? TV outside, the folks in the hallway are able to participate and watch. Close it slightly, Council. We can't shut it in its entirety. I'm hearing it over here. Thank you. Janice, maybe just put the mic a little closer, I guess. Thank you. How's that? A little better? Yes. 
So um, before I get started, I just wanted to take an opportunity to introduce some folks that usually follow me every year when we come to the budget hearing. Um, I don't have as big a crowd as you see here, but I do have a um, strong group of supporters. Um, they're volunteers and they're also members of our board of directors. So as I've done in past years, I like to take this opportunity to talk about um, what we do at the Council on Aging, um, where, what we've done in this last year, and where we're heading in the future. Senior centers reach the hard to reach. One in six seniors living alone in the United States faces physical, cultural, and or geographical barriers that isolate them from their peers and communities. 60%, that 60% of our elder population in Brockton is living with four or more chronic conditions. This isolation can prevent them from receiving benefits and services that can improve their economic security and their ability to live healthy, independent lives. Fortunately, we at the COA are here to help them. So, this year, we welcomed a large number of new members to the center. We started a collaboration with the YMCA to provide programs to our seniors at a reduced rate. We are working with Brockton Housing Authority to deliver 2,000 monthly newsletters to each of their senior sites. Our congregate lunch program on Tuesdays has tripled. We have a new roadside sign coming in the next few weeks, so now people will actually know where we are, because a lot of people don't. And lastly, and this is, um, this is the first announcement being made of this, our friends group is looking into possibly enlarging the center. We're busting at the seams. Um, we need more space. So they brought the idea up recently. They've talked to an architect. We have some blueprints that have been made up. Um, so we'll be hot on the trail in no time to, to try to help them raise funds. Um, but let's not forget that in addition to providing a great variety of social opportunities, this year we have provided an overwhelming number of assistance services to our seniors. And here are just some of the things that we've provided. We provide ongoing food and fuel assistance. We help folks with utility bills and um, shutoffs. We, we try to help them get their utilities turned back on. And overwhelming number of Medicare and mass health issues. We educate on scams because we know they're out there and they prey on our elders. We help them with the housing process. And in my opinion, we don't have enough housing in the city of Brockton for our seniors. We work with family caregivers. We provided free hearing aids to folks that couldn't provide or couldn't afford the hearing aids. One of my new outreach coordinators was able to get life-sustaining medication not covered by an insurance company for an in individual. Lynn Winkler, another one of my outreach coordinators, um, provided transportation, or she arranged transportation to a hospital in Boston for someone who was quite ill and needed to get the care in Boston um, to continue living, basically. They had a very serious heart condition. Protective service referrals. We are, at the COA, a safe and trusting haven for seniors to come to report elder abuse. It is heartbreaking to sit with someone in their 80s who is living in fear of leaving their bedroom because of, of an abusive daughter and feels the only solution is to end their life. And finally, we continue to advocate for our most vulnerable and overwhelmed population on a daily basis. So you may wonder, how are we able to provide all that with a staff of two and a half? Well, we have priceless volunteers. They gave the city 760 hours of volunteer service, which calculates to a little over $15,000. That's how we make it happen. Our goals for this year, 
will be to continue to work as hard as we do every day to provide an opportunities for our seniors to live a lifestyle based on independence, and we are committed to helping our seniors age with dignity and security. We will support our friends group on their project to expand the center. We will continue to be visible presence in the community, and we will explore ways to meet the needs of our aging seniors and the baby boomers. I think some of you are the baby boomers. <laughs> the COA is a community focal point for social and support services to our over 15,000 15, seniors, their families, and caregivers. So in closing, I am very proud of what we have accomplished in these last 12 months and the number of seniors that we were able to make an impact and hopefully change their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. <laughs> Councilors, I entertain any questions for Mrs. Fitzgerald. I actually have Council Bonds. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Good, Councillor. Uh, just a question about the number of seniors in the city, the fifth, over 15,000, almost 16. Was that from the 2010 census? Yep, it's actually 15,883 right. people 60 or older. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep. Mrs. Gerald, I just want to say I want to thank you for what you do. You are a staff for only two and a half. And also, I think we'd be remiss, uh, you lost someone recently who was very dedicated to the Council on Aging, Mr. Harry Owens, yep. who always sat every budget year. So uh, he's in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, anything else for uh, Mrs. Fitzgerald? Thank you for your time tonight, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Clerk, agenda item number one, please. Before we do that, I'm sorry, I have a letter here I want to read into the record. It's dated May 29, 2014, RE Fiscal Year 2015 DPW Budget Hearings. Uh, please be advised I will be unable to attend the above referenced DPW Budget Hearing as I will be out of the country on vacation. The following staff members will represent me at the hearings. This is from Michael L. Forsen, Commissioner of DP DPW. Uh, Administration Renewable Energy, uh, Elaine uh, Chire will be here, Administrative Assistant. Engineering Division, Howard B. Newton, Superintendent. Highway and Maintenance Divisions, uh, Craig C. Young, Superintendent. Refuse, uh, Craig C. Young, Superintendent. Patrick Sullivan, Recycling Coordinator. Sewer Division will be Larry Rowley, who's the Superintendent of Utilities. Water Division, Larry Rowley, Superintendent of Utilities. And Brian Creed, who's the Water and Systems Manager. I just want to get that into the record. Agenda item number one, please. Mayor, Honorable Bill Carpenter. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Mr. President, members of the uh, City Council, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Fiscal year 15 is confronted with the same fundamental financial difficulties which have affected previous city budgets for the past decade or so. Coming into the fiscal year 15 budget, we immediately were faced with the burden of covering a $1 million deficit for the cost of last year's snow and ice removal. Costs for health insurance and pensions are growing more rapidly than revenues. The state has not restored cuts to unrestricted aid. And the Chapter 70 formula for designating funds for public schools is skewed, as it does not adequately account for the true cost of educating our population of students, particularly in a gateway city like Brockton with a student population that is growing by over 400 students a year. Unrestricted state aid reductions have been detrimental to the city since fiscal year 2002 as a result of inconsistent state budget policies. The benefits in health insurance cost savings from the concessions obtained from both active and retired employees in 2012 has been overtaken by the basic rate of underlying health inflation plus the growth in the number of people covered. This year, the cost of health insurance is up 4% or approximately $1 million. Providing pension coverage for current and future retirees plus maintaining the funding schedule to finance unfunded liabilities has significantly increased, up by 13% over last year. In formulating the budget proposal, I relied on several basic principles. I sought to avoid proposing total appropriations which would require that the city raise its property tax levy by the 2.5% allowed by law. 
That meant more than $2.9 million in revenue would not be available to support spending. The way the current levy is allocated between business and residents results in one of the highest commercial tax rates in the state. And as we look to encourage investment and create jobs in Brockton's economy, a tax increase would be devastating to those efforts. I've also sought to avoid any reduction in staffing or overtime costs in the police department budget. In fact, there are no public safety employee layoffs called for in this budget. Good faith cooperation from the Brockton Firefighters Local 144 allowed us to reduce the fire department budget by about $400,000, preventing firefighter layoffs. I want to personally and publicly thank the union for working with us. In fact, this budget has absorbed the costs of the contract settlements with both the police and fire unions achieved during the past year. I did also seek to comply with all requirements of the law and follow past practices in forming the school department budget while still providing a $3.6 million increase in local funding to the schools in this budget. I've examined every budget and every line item in the ordinary maintenance categories for possible reductions. Department heads were asked to provide cost reduction ideas. I incorporated many of these suggestions, plus some additional suggestions based on an analysis of spending in fiscal year 14. You will find some funded but unfilled positions in the fiscal year 15 budget. There is a critical need to fill these positions as soon as possible. During the past few months, we were very conservative in filling openings as to provide budget flexibility this year in the event that we needed to use attrition to balance the budget. Over the past few weeks, we determined that we could maintain these positions in the fiscal year 15 budget, but chose to wait for these budget hearings to preserve the integrity of the budget process. Many positions have already been lost during the past six budgets, and we will be unable to maintain city services at the current levels without filling these open positions. You'll find that the budgets of 17 departments were reduced from fiscal year 14 to FY15. Appropriations to reserves were slightly reduced, but the supplemental reserve fund for fiscal stability was funded to the statutory level. Five departments were either level funded or received increases of less than $10,000, and 13 general fund budgets received increases of more than $10,000. And as I mentioned earlier, my recommended budget for the Brockton Public Schools is about $3.6 million higher than last year's appropriation. I do believe that the school budget difficulties that will be outlined by Superintendent Smith here this evening are mainly due to student population growth, cutbacks in federal grant monies, and to fundamental problems in the Chapter 70 methodology. As regards to Schedule 19, some 200 plus communities in Massachusetts are permitted by law to count the cost of health insurance for retired school employees in the Schedule 19 accounts. Another 100 plus communities are not allowed to do so. Brockton is one of the 100 communities prohibited from counting these costs towards the school budget. This discrepancy dates back to confusion over the original instructions from the state after the Education Reform Act, and this discrepancy has been allowed to continue despite the distortion to state education data and despite the inequity of this treatment. Nonetheless, for the past several years, the city has prepared its budget and hope that it will be allowed to count costs for retiree health insurance. Therefore, my budget assumes the cost of retiree health insurance will be permitted to be counted by Brockton. Expenses include only $5.6 million for these costs. Although these, those costs paid by the city in fiscal year 14 actually totaled $8 million. That represents an additional $8 million paid by the city that is not reflected in the school budget. Enterprise fund budgets are in relatively good financial standing. The refuse fund has a revenue structure which adequately pays for the costs of the fund and generates a surplus, paying for staff, the trash contract with allied waste, 
and periodic investments in capital equipment. The Renewable Energy Fund bears the operating costs of the solar field, and the revenues of the sewer fund remain adequate to pay for the operating costs of the system. The Parks and Recreation Fund required a significant increase in the direct subsidy from the general fund this year. This is because golf course revenues are declining even as the costs in the Enterprise Fund for parks, recreation, and golf are increasing. The increase was needed to maintain services, but I will tell you that improvements to the golf course operation have been an early focus of this administration. The Water Enterprise Fund remains badly influenced by its rate structure. The cost base continues to rise with substantial contractual costs for contracts with both Veolia and Aquaria. Without new revenues, the rest of that budget has suffered. The maintenance workforce has been reduced and the funding for the small main replacement program, including both materials and the crew, was eliminated in an earlier budget and never restored. I think many of you will find that after this week's deliberations that I have remained true to the convictions I've held since I first began running for office. We have worked hard to produce a fair and balanced budget that maintains city services and does not require a tax increase. I look forward to working with the members of the council during these budget hearings and request that when this process is complete that you will approve the FY15 budget as presented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Questions for the mayor? Councilors, any questions for the mayor? Councilor Stewart. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, thank you for the presentation. Good evening, Councilor. I had a general question. I know we're going to talk specifically about your office, the budget for your office, but just. I, I believe that's first up on the right. agenda. Uh, the, the overall philosophy of um, not reaching the two and a half um, threshold, what, is, what do the out years look like? Um, I mean, have you guys looked at projections, and is this a trend that you expect to continue over the next several years? I just sort of think a little bit about the Bush tax cuts, which caused a revenue fall for the nation, which in turn caused some economic difficulties, and our not being able to put money away in the future is something that I'm assuming that you and the CFO right. have talked about. No, I, I think that's a fair observation. I think uh, if you were to say, could we... Uh, use the same methods for the next five or six consecutive years with nothing changing and continue to deliver city services at the same level? No, we couldn't. Um, I believe this is the first step in a game plan that includes increasing revenues to the budget from other sources outside of residents' and businesses' property taxes. Um, we've been in office for five months. We came in in the middle of this budget year. So we are working on a number of um, revenue enhancements that will begin to kick in in the next budget year and we believe that over the course of the next few years we will be able to um, increase revenues into the budget outside of just property tax revenues and our continued ability to maintain the current tax rate would be contingent on our ability to develop additional revenues. I see. And then the amount of money that we're not increasing the levy by, what's that total amount and then of these projects that you have in the works, what are your estimations on the, the sure. amount of revenue they would generate? Um, the, uh, if we were to raise taxes by the maximum increase allowed by law, uh, that would generate about $2.9 million. Um, I believe that we'll be able to generate a similar amount over the course of the next year due to revenue enhancements, and we're looking, we've started on some, and more will be coming. Uh, I think as an example, the the auctions of uh, city-owned tax title properties. We're projecting that to generate about $1.5 million in the upcoming year. That would be about half of it right there. Um, we've certainly, uh, we're making an effort to ask uh, our nonprofit uh, organizations in the city to voluntarily help us out. It's hard to predict what that will generate, but I, I do believe that there will be some help. Um, and we're continuing to look at, at uh, implementing other strategies for generating additional revenue. Um, I think that uh, it would be fair to say on the water and sewer side uh, that we need to address the outstanding issue with Stonehill College. Um, I think we also uh, need to seek relief under that Aquaria contract that draws about one-third of the entire water department budget. 
Um, but those are longer term solutions. Uh, but I do believe that um, we have a commitment to generate additional sources of revenue um, to make up for not taking the, uh, the tax increase for the maximum levy. Um, if down the road at some point uh, I was uh, faced with a situation that I thought it was financially irresponsible to continue without increased, uh, I would make that tough decision, but I don't, I don't foresee that. I believe that we will be able to generate additional revenue for the budget. Great. And, and two last questions, uh, Mr. President, if I may. So we are looking at, obviously, those fixed costs that continue to increase uh, over time. So I'm, I'm assuming, of course, your projections uh, include the costs that rise, whether or not there's additional spending. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly um, sort of set the stage for people on how this process works, because I've gotten a, a number of phone calls and email messages about what we can and can't do as a city council in terms mm -hmm. of the budget that you've presented. Uh, just so the public is aware, just by statute, the city council, we cannot appropriate monies or move monies around. Frankly, we can only cut from the mayor's budget. Uh, so the budget really is generated from the mayor's office. Um, I guess we could, and I guess in effect, we could reject the entire budget and ask the mayor's office to come back with a whole new budget. Um, mm -hmm. But there are some state deadlines that must be met in terms of presenting a budget to the state and uh, moving on that issue. So I just want to make certain that it's clear that people understand right. that. And then my second uh, point in terms of the school department, uh, as we know, most of the school funding comes from, not from local taxpayers, but from the state Correct. Uh, and, and grants. So some of the struggles on the school side really are not uh, directly related to the city side budget and I want to make certain people understand that as well. I think it would be fair to say that none of the current uh, budget uh, shortfalls of the uh, operating budget for the schools is directly related to any actions on the part of the city. The Chapter 70 allocation, which does include some contribution from, this, from the city side, um, is up $3.6 million from last year. And I will be the first one to agree with the superintendent that her operating costs have gone up even more than that. Um, and I think I outlined some of the factors that the superintendent, I'm sure, will outline in much greater detail as to the financial pressures uh, that the school system is bearing this year. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Constant. Constant Denapoli. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Good evening. I just have two questions, uh, two expenditures in your office. Are we on to my office budget now? Can I refer to my copy? Yeah. I thought we still. Just help me yeah, out, Mr. We President. We can go to that. Does anybody else have any other questions before we go to the, the actual specific department? I do, actually. You want to hold okay. your question, Council? Yes, I'll. Thank you, Council. Council Bonds. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Councilor. In reading uh, the CFO's certification letter, I believe that's what it is, there was something in here, in addition to some of the suggestions, suggestions that you mentioned to Councilor Stewart, are you also looking into, um, I guess, advising from some of the, the uh, things that um, Mr. Condon said about examining some of the insurance costs and the retiree insurance benefits and things. Is this something that you're looking into? I'm not sure about it? the, are we looking to cutting retiree benefits? No. Um, no, no, no. Are we looking at every line item in the budget and did we look very hard at it? Yes, we, you know, we made almost $3 million in uh, cuts from what the department heads originally asked for. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that also the uh, recommendations that he suggested that they're also taken into I've consideration more time as well with as some of the projected funds you know from the um, the sale of all of the properties and some of those right. other things that are are in question this is something a little more concrete uh, council i can tell you i've spent more time with mr condon in the last six weeks than i have with my family <laughs> okay thank you thank you mr president council thank you uh, thank you mr president good evening mr mayor good evening councilor and i thank you for being here this evening and making your presentation and I, I do commend you um, on your first budget and also commend you in, in trying to find a way that you're not able, you know, you're not raising any, any type of property taxes and not using the 2.5%, you know, using it to the threshold, and I, and I do commend you on that. Um, I also look at it in my own mind that I don't think it's something that you're going to be able to do every budget after budget, but maybe you can in the ways that you've addressed some of your issues in, in looking at you know, some long-term solutions uh, to bringing in um, added revenue in, into the city. And, and, that's, and that is all, definitely all, all positive at this point in time. Right. I don't think you could continue to cut the budget forever. You would have to generate additional revenues, and that's what our plan has been from day one. Right. And I appreciate that. I, I, but I guess 
I guess my question is, and um, I guess, you know, having been here for several years and, and having been on the other side as, as well uh, for several years, I would probably have to venture to say it's the first time that I've seen the council chambers be filled with so many people here that are very much, very much um, showing the importance of, of the school system to the city of Brockton. And, and you know, as a former school committee member, And, and I don't mean that in any such way. You were a school committee member as well, so you, you know the importance that, that education is um, to all of us and, and to you as well. But I guess my, my question is, because of the situation they have, which isn't, as you just alluded to, isn't so much in light to what we have to deal with here on the city side, but, in all, and also in all fairness, I mean, we have to make sure that, you know, the children of this city are being educated in, in the correct manner, and I'm sure they're going to continue to be. But I guess my, my question to you is, um, looking at some of those long-term solutions to bring in revenue, I, I guess I'm just concerned in how can we, as all of us, help and try to solve the situation that the school department is under, and I think it's probably the first time since the mid-'80s, early-'90s that they've They've gone this route, and I, I think you'd probably be agreeable to that, that we've had this type of situation. But Well, I would say five years ago, my first year on the school committee, we had a similar type of budget uh, that had dramatic cuts in it, and it took us uh, probably a full year to restore uh, the things that were cut. I, to respond to your question, Counselor, I think that uh, what is apparent is the, the long-term solution is not going to be to try to keep taxing increases on city residents to cover the cost of schools. As Council Stewart mentioned, the vast majority of the education funding comes from the state. Mm -hmm. And there are real problems right now uh, with the Chapter 70 formula and allocation uh, that is um, really penalizing a handful of gateway cities like Brockton who are uh, growing, have student populations growing very rapidly. Brockton's looking at a third consecutive year of an increase of 400 to 450 students, while almost all school districts across the state uh, have flat enrollment and many have slightly declining enrollments. Right. So, you know, we're carrying the cost of educating about 400 students from this year with absolutely no reimbursement from the state. And we've also got about 300 to 350 students who came in after October 1st of last year that we're also not receiving funding for from the state. And it's clear to me that we have to join forces with the other gateway cities mm -hmm. in uh, working with our legislators to compel the state to come up with some form of pothole funding or short-term reimbursement for new students until the regular Chapter 78 kicks in. I believe if you look at the additional number of students that we're carrying without reimbursement this year, uh, the, the reimbursement lost is somewhere in the area of eight to nine million dollars. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a real problem there. There was also some other things, and again, I don't want to go too far into Superintendent Smith's domain, uh, but they used an inflation factor of less than one percent, which was just totally unrealistic based upon increases in um, costs of labor, um, the, um, our existing CBA uh, with the teachers calls for a million dollars in step rate increases this year. Uh, the cost of health insurance for teachers is up a million dollars this year. There was a loss of about 1.5 million in race to the top money, and that's all piled on this huge inequity in the way that the state is allocating the Chapter 70 funding. So, I think that the um, I think that the challenges facing the funding of the school department right. are much larger than anything that's a quick fix in the city budget. And, and no doubt about that. And, and I, I would probably, you know, rest assured, uh, you as being a mayor and, and in charge of a city this size and, and an educational you know, department that size, I'm sure you've already picked up the telephone and started to rattle the cages of our own state delegation and even some of our own federal people because of the importance that this has um, to us here in the city of Brockton. I right. mean, and it, and it de definitely raises a, you know, a strong flag to me. I mean, things have changed since when I was over there some years ago, but still, 
we're an urban city, and it's a different city than it was, different city than when I was born almost 60 years ago. It's totally different. It's a different outlook to, to what we have today. I have great concern for, you know, some of the youngsters that are in the school system that, you know, have come into the city over the last several years, as you do and as everybody else does that's in this room, I'm sure. Um, great concern with, you know, the ESL program and what's going to happen there, um, how far we've advanced over these last several years, um, you know, working with those uh, children. Um, so, I mean, whatever we have to do as a council, I think, you know, we'll step up to the plate and do. There's no doubt there are some things that we'll probably be discussing here. There's been talk about whether there'd be a, uh, any type of a water rate, sewer rate increase, um, which is not before the city council yet, and people need to understand that. There'll be some discussion, but there's nothing that's been proposed to us. The concerns will be can we and can we not utilize some of those funds. We're not even sure of that because we have situations even with our own water main um, pipelines that are even on neighborhood streets and I'm sure you're already hearing that just as a mayor as well. Right. Um, so these are things that we have to wrestle with but, but I just want, you know, I want the people to know that no matter what we can do, we're going to do and, you know, whatever has been brought to us here this evening and with the folks that are here, it's not falling on a deaf ear. Um, education is most clear and dear to all of us and, and uh, it seems that when these things do happen, unfortunately, it, it happens where some of the smaller things that mean so much to the school system get hurt. And, and that's what we want to, um, we want to be able to save. And, and I know that, um, you know, I'll, I'll put my other hat on and help the best that I, I can. And I think that the taxpayer would understand, uh, you know, some of the things that we have to go through. But uh, in any case, I just, I just wanted to, you know, get an insight a little bit more deeper. And, and we need to keep on our state and, and our own federal people. We really, really do. I mean, we're all held accountable. Everyone needs to be held accountable right now because times are tough and it's, it's not going to get easy. But I, I appreciate that, Mayor, and I appreciate you taking time. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Councilor. I, I don't know, ask, and as somebody who's had kids go through the schools, and I look at, uh, none of us want to raise taxes, but the short term pain of what we may end up doing by not raising those taxes. Are you, aren't you afraid that as class sizes get to 35 and 40, that the middle class families that we have are going to leave the system and leave the city? And in, then we become, instead of, pardon me because I don't have my glasses on, 60% uh, low income free lunch, 70% and then 80%. And we actually exacerbate the problem by, and again, I don't want to vote to raise taxes. I, if I do, I, there's a good chance I won't be here in two years. But don't you think the short-term gain of not raising, going to the full two and a half levy, will hurt us more in the in the short term before we can fix? And by the way, you're right. The the questions have to be answered. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm trying to find the best way. I'm not looking for. I represent Ward One. We have a lot of people who I think have a choice fiscally on where to live. And I'm not saying I'm the only ward that has that. There are many. But aren't you afraid that we're going to lose a lot of that middle class, which right now is the backbone financially of the city, and then cause even more problems in the long term? Well, Council, I also had my children attend the Brockton Public Schools. I know. Five of my six children attend the Brockton Public Schools. My grandson is a student at the Downey School today. So I, no one's more concerned about the uh, the quality of education in this city than I am. There's no doubt that this is a extremely difficult budget this year and uh, the cuts that are being proposed are painful. I also do believe that if we're going to get the city turned around long term, uh, we cannot keep raising taxes. And I think even if you did throw money into that school department budget this year, it's a Band-Aid, it doesn't really fix anything. The, the problem exists right back again next year because the only way we're going to fix this budget going forward in terms of the schools uh, is at the state level and perhaps with some federal help, but primarily at the state level. Um, right now, using round numbers this year, Councillor, you know, the total budget for the schools is like $203 million, 160 of that million from the state and about $43 million from the city. So you can see that the vast majority of the funding for schools comes at the state level. And there are some critical problems with the way the state is dispersing that Chapter 70 fund 
to a city like Brockton, to a gateway city. There are half a dozen cities like Brockton that are being placed in an impossible position, and we've got to get the relief at the state level, where, as I mentioned earlier, the population is growing by 400, 450 students a year. Um, we don't get paid for this year's students until next year. Right. So we carry those costs for a year. How much we get paid next year depends upon our census on October 1st. Well, of those 400, 450 kids will gain, about 300 will come in after October 1st. That means those 300 students, not only do we not get reimbursed for them next year, we don't get reimbursed for them until the year after that. That is a gross inequity that only impacts half a dozen communities like Brockton. And uh, I think this, the solution to that has to come at the state level. That's an eight or nine million dollar problem. Uh, that alone, along with some of the other inequities, I mean, there's no doubt that our growing student population um, contains uh, a lot of students that are more expensive to educate than the average student across the state. We have a significant percentage of English language learners. We have a sig significant percentage of students with special needs. Uh, so, I mean, these are students that not only are we getting the, we're not getting the reimbursement, but we're accepting them into our system, at, and they're even more expensive than the average student to, to educate. So, you know, do I believe the, the schools are important to the future of the city? Of course I do. Um, I also believe that we are fighting to get the economy of the city turned around. We're trying to bring investment into the city. Um, and I think that if we were to raise the taxes this year, with the, where the rates already are, would have a devastating effect on those efforts. And so, you know, I, I, I don't dispute anything that you're saying, Councillor. You know, I don't dispute anything that you're saying, but I, I feel it's critical that we hold the line on taxes this year. And I don't dispute your commitment to the schools. I know that. I know you. you I know some of your kids. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know they've been four I just years worry, of my life on the school committee too. I, I worry more about more that the short term. And I agree completely. And one of the questions when we get to the school budget, I want to get it explained to me whether the state is actually doing their job under the court orders that came down the, the Hancock case and all. That whether that's the way we go, but. Getting the relief from the state is not going to be in the next two months, four months, six months. It's going to take a lot of work at that level and p possibly another court case. I don't, I don't know that. We'll have to be, we'll have to talk about that. But I'm just worried that by that the the short term fix. And I agree, it is a band aid. It's a band aid. But most of what we end up doing here, the way the budgets are set up now, are all band aids. And I'm just afraid that by not applying the Band-Aid right now, by the time we do get the help we need, it may be, it may be too late. That's I, just my thought on I, it. I so. think the other factor to consider, Councillor, is if we did have a tax increase, it would not all automatically go to the school budget. I oh, mean, I agree with that. Absolutely. We've got 17 city budgets that had their budget reduced this year, another 10 that are level. Um, we have understandings with a couple of our unions that are allowing us to save money, and those understandings would no longer be in force if, if we had additional revenue. So there's no doubt that any, if that additional money did come in, it would have to be spread around equally and fairly. So certainly the schools would get a significant piece of it, but by no means would they be getting all of no, it. No, I agree completely, and anybody thinks that, you know, I mean, in fact, if we get to talking about a water rate increase down the road, very little of that will end up making it to the schools because we have pipes that are just falling apart under the street. So uh, uh, just just my thought on it. So thank you. And, and thank I, you I appreciate all your thoughts, thoughts, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Mr. Mayor, I just had a few questions. Sure. First of all, I want to recognize the school committee members that are here tonight. I want to thank you for being here. I know you're doing yeoman's work as well, uh, doing what you have with, you know, where you are relative to the dollar amounts. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, relative to preserving the city side, which you did, but not, not increasing the taxes and not raising taxes, uh, I mean, we'll just cut to the chase. I mean, the impact, the negative impact and detrimental impact is on the school side right now, without question. And that's why this place is packed with people that are relative to the schools. And my dad's a retired Brockton High teacher, so I'm a product of Brockton Public Schools myself. But, but I guess what I'm trying to figure out as, as an elected official, as you are and all of us here, um, sustainability going forward. We talked about Band-Aid approaches, uh, the pilot program you're thinking about doing, selling property, but there's also going to be a finite number of dollars that are going to be able to come in. So if we're talking about this year and the budget is passed as presented, um, the impact is going to be detrimental, devastating, I'd even say, to the school side. 
what do you see as the mayor going forward for sustainability? Because there isn't a cushion there for services or programs. So I'm looking, I guess, to try to get a forecast from you. Because yeah. if we look at well, free cash, the percentage is only 11% on the forecast. Right. I think, first of all, Councillor, um, uh, to be fair, the school department budget was calculated the same way that it's been calculated for many years. And, and uh, the allocations, the expenses, the pass-through of Chapter 70 was done in the exact same manner that it's been done in recent budgets. And it did generate a $3.6 million increase. Now, clearly, the school department is now presenting needs in excess of $3.6 million. But there is a $3.6 million increase. Um, the sustainability question is a fair question, but I would say we've only been here for five months. So uh, we came in in the middle of this budget year, had to begin working almost immediately on the upcoming budget. And I did feel it was critical this year to hold the line on taxes. Uh, we've certainly talked about a number of different ways of uh, increasing the revenues coming from sources other than just raising property taxes. And I've outlined some of them tonight, and there'll be other initiatives coming forward in the upcoming months. So, Such as, such as fees, the enterprise for an article. I think that... Um, I think that fee structure is absolutely something that we're in the process of looking at, uh, and not in a punitive way, but in, in terms of looking at other cities comparable to Brockton and what their fee structures currently are, and also looking at passing some costs on directly to the folks who are um, demanding those services. So I think that as an example, uh, some of the fees in the Board of Health uh, will be bringing forward recommendations to the Board of Health asking for increases in, in some of those fees, specifically around certificates of fitness um, and uh, dumpster permits, uh, not the permanent dumpster permits, but the temporary roll-off containers that are only a $10 permit right now. And I anticipate that as we look at some other city fees, uh, I will be in front of the council looking to ask the council to consider some ordinance changes. And again, not in a punitive manner, but I believe that when, uh, an arm's length look at many of the fees charged by the city right now in comparison to other comparable cities were well below the median or the average. And I think that it, it would be incumbent upon us to get those fees in line with what other cities like Brockton are charging. So that's certainly on the table. I mean, um, you know, I think that uh, the council just spent quite a bit of time at a recent FinCon meeting looking at the Aquaria contract. Uh, that, that Aquaria contract is breaking the back of the water department budget right now. And uh, we've, we've got to find a resolution to that. And I certainly look forward to working with the council on that this year also. Um, so I think there are, a number of, uh, there are a number of ways to generate additional revenue. I am not proposing for a minute that you can just you know, make cuts every year. In fact, our spending is up a little bit this year. Our spending is up by about 1% this year. So the notion that we've cut the budget uh, is, is just a little misleading. We haven't cut the budget. I chose not to increase it by more than we had to, and that I felt that we could balance the budget with the projected revenues as they stand right now without going to the well for another 2.5% increase. Are you comfortable that this budget presented will make it 12 months, that you won't have to come for a supplemental appropriation? Absolutely. I think that as I've watched the budget process over many years, you've been a council for many years, years, I think there are always some supplemental appropriations because some things change over the course of a year. Um, but that's certainly not a decision that I get to make unilaterally as the mayor. That's an issue that I bring to the council's attention and ask for the council's permission to shift some money from one budget item to another. But I'm very comfortable with the budget as presented to you, Councillor. Thank Mr. you, Mr. 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 President. Hi. Just, yeah, to, just, to, just to cheer today, okay. Mr. President. Okay. <laughs> Counselors, I, I'm just very, very concerned about a lot of Brockton residents sending their students, their children, to West Bridgewater, East Bridgewater, I mean, outside of the district. I'm very concerned about that. Yeah, yeah. So, so as I said, the day that we all got sworn in, we have to do what we can with what we have where we are. Well, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. We're stuck right now, and we have to think and put politics aside and all this stuff and just work together for the best of Brockton. That's why we serve. Councillor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it. Councillor Dubois. 
Good evening. Um, and your work on this budget. So just going line by line with you, if you don't mind. Are we going to my budget now? Yes, uh, so we're going to the budget. I Here's thought the we mayor's. were on the mayor's budget. Are well, we we're going? actually into the introduction process. Oh, but then I will wait. I apologize. Does anybody else have no. any questions relative to the intro? Nobody? If not, then, Council, we're going to go to Council DiNapoli and then come back to you. Council DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. President. Council, if you could give me Mr. just Mayor. one second to get on uh, my you budget. Put your please. glasses on? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I just have, uh, just have two questions because two of your line items have increased, okay? One, of course, is your, your staff, your personnel. And the other one is the increase of $150,000 from cable. One hundred yeah, twenty-five thousand from five fifty to six seventy-five. Just, yeah, uh, just correct. There's a there's an increase in my budget of about one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. One hundred and twenty-five of that one sixty-five is going uh, to BCA. Uh, you'll recall during some FinCom hearings earlier in the spring, uh, it was brought to our attention that there was a memorandum of agreement that had been in existence for a number of years. Uh, that was retrieved. We've looked at it, and the commitment I made to the council at that time is that we would comply with that agreement. And uh, so the calculation uh, that we've done based upon 75% of revenues directly to BCA uh, comes up with that calculation of 675. The 550 had been level for a long time, uh, I think five, six years at least. So it is being adjusted from 550 to 675. That is money that's coming in from Comcast into the general fund and then being passed back through out to BCA in accordance with the, uh, with the memorandum of agreement that uh, was entered into it the last time we did a contract. That's 125 of the 165. The other 40 is on my staff. I would point out to you, uh, first of all, I think that there's been a lot of due diligence done on my staff already earlier in the year. Um, but I would point out two things to you. First of all, there are no raises on that staff, none. And also, there is a no overtime budget in my office, zero. So I've got a lot of folks who work a lot of hours, a lot more than 40 hours a week, and they are not eligible for overtime. Uh, and they are not getting raises this year either. So what I'm asking the council to do is just to allow my current staffing at the current level to remain in place. The other thing is you mentioned to us the other day that City Hall is going to be open later on Mondays, I believe? Yes. That there's no additional cost to that. Um, we are using comp time so that uh, folks who were, it, we're using a skeleton schedule <clears throat> very similar to what we do on certain holidays of the year, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, uh, there are a couple of others, where the department head will just staff with a skeleton staff and whoever stays late on that skeleton staff will get to leave early on Friday. It's a comp time arrangement. There's no impact in terms of dollars and cents. And it's on a voluntary basis. No one is being required to stay late on Monday night. Um, our indications are that there's you know, a good amount of interest on a voluntary basis for folks that are willing to stay late on a Monday night in order to go home early on a Friday. And we've set that um, matrix up because uh, you know, another observation is that City Hall is pretty quiet on Friday afternoons. So it's a time that if there's a couple people that stayed late on Monday night, they leave early on Friday, we're still able to provide services on Friday afternoon also. That's a good pick of the week because we're here on Monday. Well, <laughs> the, Monday, the Monday night, well that was, Council, that was part of the reasoning. It, it's, it's for there to be no additional cost out of the you know, 52 Mondays, there's got to be about 42 of them that there's either a city council or a FinCon meeting, and the building's open anyhow. So there's no additional cost to the building being open. The building's already open on almost every Monday night. And on the weeks that there is a Monday holiday, there just will be no Monday, there'll be no late night on those weeks. We won't be staying open, late open on Tuesday night. It'll, on a week with a Monday holiday, there just won't be a late night that week. But the feedback that I've received from folks has been overwhelmingly positive. I think that um, there are a lot of working folks with jobs that if they need to get into City Hall, uh, they have to take time off of work and this will give them a chance to 
get in to conduct routine business on, on Monday nights. I personally think it's a great idea, and I'm, I'm glad you're trying it anyway. It, 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 was, it was done under the Harrington administration, right. too. And I think that uh, when I presented this to the, to, the, to the department heads, I indicated that uh, you know this was for 12 months. We would pilot this for 12 months, and then we would sit down and, and with the department heads and take a hard look at it and uh, make sure that it's working. I think it's one step in many ways in which we're striving to make it um, more use, city hall and city services more user friendly for residents. Uh, you know, we'll be rolling out a new website soon that will have increased capability to do a lot of city transactions online. It'll have a virtual city hall that will allow you to download and print almost any city form or application without having to actually come into city hall and get it. So it's not the purpose of our hearing tonight, but they, it is part of an overall effort on our part to make city hall more accessible. I agree with you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for putting that out there for the public, and I thank, thank you, you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Dubois, followed by Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. Hello, uh, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Councilor. So, um, just going line by line, I see that the Mayor's um, personnel budget has raised $69,856 from 2003. I'm choosing 2003. 2003, okay. I'm choosing 2003 because since you came into office, you allocated more money to the 2014 budget budget than the previous mayor had um, coming in and asking for appropriations that the city council did approve. So if we cycle back to 2003, um, which was before you came into the office and what the budget was working on, that's a $70,000 um, increase. So uh, for that amount of money, we could hire another um, teacher. You know, I think, council, if you went back 11 years. I've been saying, I mean 2013, well, not then, 2003, well, then, then, please then you, forgive, then 2013. Then your number is inaccurate. Um, it's in the budget book, so right. no, the, for, the, let me just 30, finish, 30, please. 39,000 and change. Okay, so um, 477,000. $998 subtracted by $408,142 no, no. equals $69,856. Well, you're going back two years. I'm going back to 2013 because you were in mayor as part of the FY14 budget cycle and we transferred in additional dollars for you to hire two new employees. No, that which was, plays no, into that, that. that number does not reflect that. It must because that's 2000. Well, okay. So. I was not the mayor when the 2014 budget was set. The revised budget, yes. The revi is Mr. Condon here? Because yeah. he can explain that the revised budget includes appropriations. Okay. Is he here? If not, we can ask him later, and then you no, can just here. know. Great. And, and then we'll just get clarification. Okay. Mr. Condon, could you just um, clarify if the um, 2014 revised budget would include any and all appropriations into the line item, or is that just the budget we looked at last year? That's the actual what we spend, or what is that? What is that number? Does that include 2014 the 2014 is, yeah. is a budget which reflects changes that were made at the time that the book was started to be prepared. Great. Back so, in March. so the so money, I'm not, Council, I'm not sure it would have reflected all of that. I'd have to see what the time was that the book was prepared because it, it doesn't conclude supplemental appropriations all the way up to the present moment. Could you please um, look into that for tomorrow? Just shoot me an email because yes. those appropriations were like a month or so ago or more. So I think that maybe it will be in there. I, I don't know. It may be and it may not. I just don't, okay. I don't want to answer that so question. So let's work on if it is, if they were in there, then the current budget is close to $70,000 more. And if they weren't in there, then um, <coughs> it's less. It's actually more of an increase if they're not. If, if, they're the, not. if the money is reflected in 2014 revised budget as fully supplementally appropriated, it would be the difference between that and the 2013. And since 2013, there have been two mayor's pay raises and then the changes in yep. mayor's staff compared to the prior yep. administration. So, but when, when we were, I'm, I'm ready for the mayor again. Thank you very much. But when we were going through all the appropriations, um, what, what if I'm not ready? No, I totally appreciate it. I, I really appreciate you being here and your time and all your dedication to the city 150%. So don't, act, don't feel like I'm, I don't appreciate your service because I really, really, really do. I really do. Um, it's just that when it comes down to this type of difficult uh, wire where we're facing so many layoffs of critical staff members and you see $70,000 in a mayor's office line item increased, 
uh, for administrative staff, you think what that person could be doing on the ground. So, but w you know what we'll do is um, I'll follow up with Mr. Condon, and then maybe you and I yeah. can have another. I, I think the number is probably somewhere between forty and seventy counts. I think the additional appropriation, if it's in there, was for like fourteen thousand dollars, something mm -hmm. like that. And then if you go, if we go to the cable money, that's a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar increase. So I know that the school department has a whole technology department. So instead of funding another staff member in your office, we could be funding a technology person in the school department, and then the school department could be utilizing those funds to keep another teacher on staff. So My question, my question is, when you drill down into how we're going to, because I have a problem with the use of the money, the way we're, that you're using it to pay for your personal staff in your office anyway, so it doesn't have anything to do with you at all, it, as a person, it has Ladies and gentlemen, we need to quorum at all times in the chamber. Please, respect the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. My issue has to do with just the use of cable money for any employee outside of the cable department. But once um, your administration opens that ball of wax and we have 125,000 extra dollars to use and we have a department that's losing so many people and they have a whole IT department, why wouldn't we take that money and instead of using it for a staff member in your office, why don't we, that's new, why wouldn't we use that money to retain a staff member in the IT department that can, or, that can do everything that this staff member in your office is doing, only instead of um, creating YouTube videos about policy in your department, they could be doing school stuff for kids. What, what is your argument there? Why would you choose to well, do that? Well, first of all, I think you're confusing two things. The 675 is money going to BCA as required under the MOU. That represents 75%, so that's operating budget for BCA. Uh, there is about $30,000 coming out of that cable revolving fund towards a portion of one staff member in my office, absolutely. Um, I think it's money very well spent. Um, I don't know that that money could be used for an IT person in the school department. Um, I think we, there are a lot of departments that could, could use another person, but again, uh, what I'm looking to do is provide adequate constituent services, do all the things that we need to do for the residents of the city. Um, and I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. And I think we've got people there that are not getting any raises, uh, that work a ton of extra hours. Uh, and I think if you, you see them out all the time on nights and weekends and, and things of that sort. Uh, and I don't think that $30,000 in the mayor's budget is going to solve the millions of dollars uh, that we could really use for the schools. No, no, it's not, and I, and I give you that, but it could retain an employee, and that is just what I'm thinking about. So. No, and, I, and, and if we're gonna do that type of, you know, line by line, item by item employee, you know, we can certainly do that. I think there's probably other positions that can be looked at too. Yeah, that's what this whole hearing is about. So I'm seeing that from, I'm still gonna be working on 2013 numbers, um, but if we, no, let's go to 2014 because it actually works out better in my calculations here. So 2014 is 1,485,000 and then your 2015 budget is 1,650,000. So your budget has increased considerably. 165,000, which is exactly yeah. what I said at the beginning. So when I look at that, I just think when we have so many people being laid off, but why aren't we staff cable money staff in an administrative counselor. position? Why aren't 125 we 125 of the 165 is not in my office. It's being passed through from the general fund over to BCA in accordance with the member. I mean, we, we had a FinCon meeting here in the spring. We reviewed that memorandum. We all agreed that 75% of the revenue should go through to BCA for their operating budget, and I followed through on that commitment to yeah. do that. That money is it's just being passed through. It's going, because that, the cable funds go directly into the general fund and then are paid out of the mayor's budget. If you were paying out of some other budget, then that budget would be up 125,000. Well, it's a pass-through, Councillor. I guess that's gonna be a wait and see. But it increases 40,000. If we could utilize the money to pay for a staff member in your office, we could utilize the money to pay for a staff member in the school's office as well. That's just my opinion. You don't have to agree with me. And I have an issue with laying people off and increasing budgets 
personnel budgets by seventy thousand dollars. But I mean, uh, we just it's disagree 70, on that but one. We'll, we'll agree Thank on what the numbers are. Thank you very much. Tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You good, Councillor? I am. Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, uh, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want you to spend a couple minutes just to give us a quick update on what's going on with the 21st Century Corp. I know that's another item, in, uh, that's another line in your, uh, in your budget. Um, sure. Since Mary uh, Waldron left, um, you know, to be honest with you, uh, we haven't really heard much from the 21st Century Corp. So if you could just take a couple minutes, and then I have a couple questions. Uh, well, the, the appropriation that you're referring to comes under the mayor's budget, $250,000. That's been the level appropriation for several years. 100000 of the two hundred fifty goes directly to the cost of the stadium. So in essence, the operating budget that's generated from that line item to B21 is 150000 uh, Right now, uh, I mean, the B21... We need the economic development function, and I believe that, I shouldn't say I believe, I know that the plan for the B21 board is to hire a full-time executive director that'll be working here in Brockton, and my understanding is that they simply are waiting for the budget process to be complete before doing that. A gentleman named Gordon Carr has been acting as an interim director on a part-time consultant basis uh, over the past, well, I've been here for five months, but it's been longer than that. Um, in terms of B21, you know, we're looking at making a lot of changes and going forward. I, th I think, Council, you've got to put it in the larger context of looking at um, planning, BRA, B21, they, they all interlock. And what we're looking to really do is revitalize planning and economic development in the city. It's a, it's a crucial role. So. As I've advised the councilors by email recently, we are very close to filling the planning position. I believe that B21 will be going forward um, soon with uh, their search for a new executive director. We are, or they are adding a Main Street manager uh, for July 1st, which I think will fill another critical role here in the city in working with small businesses in the three inner city business districts, Montello, Campello, and downtown. Um, it's a model we've talked about before that's been very successful in Boston over the last 20 years. Um, and my understanding is they're in the process of filling that position and expect to do so on or about July 1st. Um, we have, uh, if you ask me personally where I think we're going with it, I think what uh, we're making an effort to do is really look at some of the components that have been successful in Lowell and adopt those here in Brockton under the structure of the B21 that's already existing. Uh, and in fact, I know, I think it's someday next week, uh, we've got a group trip going up to Lowell to, uh, to tour downtown Lowell and meet with some of the, uh, the folks up there. So I, I believe that uh, it's a good investment uh, it's critical to us, you know, we, we've got to change the climate and the perception of the city of Brockton to attract investment. It's great when we get a state grant to do something, but unless we're going to parlay that into private investment, it's never going to work. And uh, so I think that um, B21 was, prior to my arrival, uh, was uh, very involved in Trinity. They were very involved in the lofts. <laughs> Uh, I know since my arrival, uh, working with uh, both yourself and Councillor Monaghan, uh, the B21 was uh, very involved with the Vicente's Market proposal uh, that we've all supported, and they did a lot of work uh, and continue to do a lot of work with them. Uh, and so I, I believe it's, it's a well-established uh, item in the budget, and I resubmitted it as I believe it makes sense. Well, the reason why I brought that up is uh, we're, we're looking at this small little binder <laughs> that we all have in front of us to try to come up with a couple of dollars and cents here and there to save the jobs that everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a product of the, of the Brockton public school system. My daughter just graduated a couple of days ago. And we can't say you know, enough about what happens in the school system. But the reason why I'm bringing that up is that we are in the process of hiring a city planner Correct. We have a functioning BRA. Yes? Yes, yeah. 
And we do have somebody in your office now who's going to be looking at into doing other things in the uh, in the development side of things. The reason uh, why no, no, he's more of a he's a liaison with the business community and with the business organizations working. You know, he does to attend work with some sort of a business the associations, business. the old colony planning council, the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, uh, all of those agencies he's working Not with. questioning the person in your office. I'm just saying that you've got somebody in that office to do some of those things. But economic development is not part of his job description. But I've always wondered. I mean, I, you drive through Boston, and every time a building goes up, it says, you know, back in the days when Menino was in office, it says Mayor Menino, and then next to it, it said the, Bro the Boston Redevelopment Authority on it. In Brockton, we don't see that. Uh, we basically see you know, the Trinity lofts or whatever, there's no BRA influence in those businesses. And I've always wondered if we have a BRA, a Brockton Redevelopment Authority, should we not put the efforts behind Brockton Redevelopment Authority to do what it's supposed to do instead of, you know, somehow always coming up with um, ways and means of deflecting the issues of redevelopment in the city? Because I think we've got we've got a bunch of a bunch of departments that are supposed to be looking into development or redevelopment in the city well, B and BRA frankly is not a city development a uh, city uh, office it's council. funded by us BRA no no, no. it comes through you i mean you're the appointments that it's you're a quasi about, it's a quasi uh, agency that right. functions well, with you're appointments. Me, are you talking about B21 or BRA council i'm talking about all of them right okay. now okay well, you know and the fact that we have all these entities whose function it is to help us develop the city. But for some odd reason, we're in the same boat that we were 10, 20 years ago. You know, I mean, yeah, you can add a couple developments here and there, but in reality, we're still talking about, I mean, it happened during the campaign. Uh, the first thing out of everybody's mouth, you know, we want downtown redevelopment, we want business development, we want to do this, we want to do that. So it's been a, uh, basically a broken record of something that we've talked about since, since I can remember. But what I'm saying, we've got all these entities whose function it is to help us develop the city. But for some odd reason, it doesn't happen. And we keep pumping funds and in, in, in creating new ones. Uh, I said this earlier uh, in this council that, in my opinion, a 21st Century Corp was developed as a cover-up uh, for what the, uh, the planning office wasn't doing. So instead of dealing with the issues of the planning office, we go out and create this uh, this uh, other department or this other function, th this other entity in the sense. So my whole thing is we try to find dollars and cents. And if we've got these uh, entities in places that are supposed to be doing what they should be doing, why aren't we getting these people all together and basically say, listen, instead of creating new departments or, or funding new departments, we're going to get these departments to do what they're supposed to be doing so we in turn can save some money and put those money someplace else where, right. and, and to be honest with you, it could probably better serve. In some well, I, I, I think, uh, Councillor, and again, I've only been here five months, what, what I envision, I think the B21, BRA, and the planner all have somewhat different roles, but I do agree with your concept that they need to all be working together cohesively, and that has not occurred in the past. Now, we haven't had a planner in six or seven years, um, but what I envision with BRA, B21, and the planner. Um, the B21 is primarily a um, private sector driven organization where businesses with their organization will be looking to help to foster economic development in the city. And that was the model that worked up in Lowell. Now it was funded a little bit differently. And I'm not saying that we would keep it the same forever. I think that's why we're taking a hard look at Lowell. I think right now, to cut from that $150,000 that's being allocated towards economic development would send the wrong message. Um, BRA just appointed a brand new executive director within the last week or two. They are independent. They have their own board. I do get to appoint some of the board members, but they do have an independent board and an independent budget. We do make a contribution towards a portion of the salary of the director. Um, their primary function, well, they've got a number of functions, uh, but they're administering the, uh, the CDBG funds, all the HUD funds, the home funds, and those funds are not as much as they used to be coming from the federal government. Um, and then I think this planning component is crucial, and uh, that's why we've made it a priority in the early months to do a legitimate search, find the best available candidate, 
get a planning department up and running. And as far as the planning department goes, I think I'm following the guidelines of the council. It was the council that established the ordinance, established the planning and junior planner uh, positions. And so I think I'm basically implementing a game plan that was already drawn up before I got here. Uh, but I believe in it 100%. I'm 100% behind it. I think it's crucial to development. So I would like an opportunity to have a real planning office, a real in, uh, economic development agency, and the BRA, and get them all working together. And I think that's the success formula. But Mr. Mayor, with, with all due respect- Including uh, the Main Street Manager. With all due respect, when I see an office of one, you know, Mary Waldron was in that office for the longest time by herself. When you see an office of one, uh, we had a, the planning office was an office of, uh, until we haven't really hired a planner yet, so it's still an office of one. It seems that we have a whole bunch of offices of, offices of one. And I don't see how much development is actually going to happen when you have an office of one, a whole bunch of offices of one. You know, you're spending a ton of money in, in overhead in terms of housing the programs that we actually have. Uh, well, that, as, far as, B20, as far as B21 goes, Council, the 150 would go towards a full-time salary of an executive director, a part-time salary of an administrative assistant, plus the rent and overhead that you described. Um, as far as the planning office goes, it will be a department of three very quickly uh, in accordance with, with, with the ordinance that was passed by the council last year, and that is that we have a planner, a junior planner, and a staff person. The staff person, as we all know, is already there. Uh, the only reason that we have not moved forward on hiring the junior planner is I think you hire the manager before the pitching coach. I think the, the, the new planner has to be involved in the selection process of the junior planner. So. You know, we're looking to hope to have that uh, city planner on board before the end of July. And, and uh, as I outlined to you in the email, I'll be bringing that appointment forward to the council for confirmation uh, very shortly. So I, I think that, um, I think economic development is a key. We do need that business sector agency. And again, if you wanted to say to me long term, I think long term, uh, I would like to wean the B21 off of the, the city budget. I just believe that cutting it today would send the wrong message when we're making this commitment to revitalize the city's economy, revitalize the downtown. We're hiring the main street manager. We're hiring the city planner. They're investments. I agree with you. They're investments, and we'll get the return on investment. Well, well I, I agree that we that it's an investment, and I think everybody that sits at this around this uh, this building, in the sense, or in this room, knows that we need business development. But what I'm saying, and I keep saying it, that it's to me it's senseless to go out and ha and have three, four offices that are poorly staffed, you know, just just offices to say we have office, you know, and that's not being productive either, because I think if we somehow pool all those resources under one roof and w whatever relationships that we can develop, you know, I understand that the BRA functions kind of independently, but they're functioning with funds that are designated for the city of Brockton. The CGBG fund is not a fund from a grant that they went out and, and wrote. No. It's, a fun, it's funds that come to the city of Brockton. But it has very specific purposes but that it, can be But it does for. come to the city of Brockton. It's not coming to the, to the agency itself. Right. So what I'm saying is that if we had basically a better coordination, I think we can actually have a lot more development taking, you know, taking place than, you know, than what we've been talking about. Because it seems that all we do, we go around and around and around creating all these entities and stuff like that, and we're not getting our return for, the, uh, for our entities. Well, I, I would say, Council, I am listening to your concerns. Um, I would also say that I inherited the current setup, and I'm working very hard to change it. So I anticipate in the very near future having a fully staffed planning office of three, uh, having a B21 office that has an executive director, a staff member, um, and then also uh, working with the BRA. So, I mean, I, well, I would like the opportunity to coordinate those agencies and efforts. I think they can sync together if they're done properly. I think it's important when a, uh, in an ideal world, I'd love to have them all under one roof, but right now I believe the place for the planning department 
is right next to the building department upstairs so that a, a builder or developer can come in, visit the planning office, walk right next door and visit the building department uh, without doing a lot of running around. But uh, I, we are looking at the Lowell plan. Uh, we're looking at potential changes to the B21 in terms of uh, uh, its structure and the major components. Uh, but I would, uh, I, so I hear some of your criticism but I think that uh, we haven't had a chance to put it all together under a new administration yet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. Is there any other questions relative to the Mayor's Department? Council Bard, followed by Dubois. Uh, just bear in mind, Councilors, we need to stay on point. This is about the budget, okay? Anything that's in here is fair game. Anything that is not in here, we should address it in a resolve and have the individual department head come before us as Finance Committee. If not, we'll be here till about 2 a.m. So let's stay on track and timely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Council. Out of state travel. Mm hmm. It's a $5,000 line item. Right. I, I guess, for lack of a better way to ask this, where are you going? Okay. <laughs> um, that $5,000 line item has been in the budget for years, in the mayor's budget. Right. Uh, I anticipate the U.S. Conference of Mayors holds two conferences a year. Mm -hmm. I think it's critically important. I, I attended the January conference um, and came back with a lot of information, connections, uh, relationships that we're developing. Um, and I think that uh, as I look around fellow mayors around the state and around the country, it's it's kind of like professional development. I mean, it's critical for mayors to be getting updated, to meet with uh, uh, the heads of various government agencies, to have a chance to participate in workshops with other mayors from around the country. I think it's a great investment for what you bring back. The other piece of it is I am planning to get down to D.C. a couple times a year uh, because I think it's important to be able to go down and lobby the congressmen and the two senators and some of the federal agencies um, to seek various forms of assistant aid grants um, for the city. And with all due respect, I, I certainly realize that we have a local office here in Brockton, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not being critical of that at all. I think there's something to be said for getting your face seen down there and having a chance to speak to people face to face, not it be a phone call from, uh, from your office or the local office of the congressman or whoever it may be. I'll tell you, I'm planning a trip down there in the near future. I'm going down to lobby for three and a half million dollars for uh, DLED uh, money for the city of Brockton that was lost in last year's budget. We have no money for DLEDing right now. I'm going down to lobby for three million dollars for BayWib for a jobs program. I'm going down to lobby for a million dollars for a ladder truck for the fire department that's critically needed. And, and so I think there is a role uh, for the mayor and I think that um, Several of the previous mayors did have some success by visiting D.C. a couple times a year. Okay, so in, in my position, I, I am privy to some information. Right. So those, those uh, conferences are when the time to go to particularly Congressman Lynch's office uh, mm -hmm. to discuss that and to lobby for those monies, the agency goes. The fire, there's a, the firefighter annual um, big conference that they have. Bay Wib, they go down there. Um, Sheila Jardin goes down there. I know that Chief Francis goes down. So you would go and accompany them when they ask for those same things that you just said that... Some, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Uh, as an example, um, uh, I don't think Chief Francis is going this year. There's a specific... There are a couple specific grants that are up right now. Uh, there's, you know, July 15th. Um, and I think that uh, uh, my experience having been down there a couple times already is that it is effective for the mayor to develop relationships with people in the in the in the offices not specifically the congressmen and the senators but with with the folks the chiefs of staff and the various offices uh, and also with some of the federal agencies I in one of my trips down there I had an opportunity to meet with the secretary of HUD you know we're, we're looking for a lot of HUD funding including that three and a half million dollars of lead abatement money that we're going to be applying for this month. So I feel it's a very small investment for the potential return. If I bring one item back a year uh, that we might not have received otherwise, I think that uh, it'll pay for itself 
tens of times over. And I do feel that attending the U.S. Conference of Mayors is critical if the mayor is going to stay up to date on what's going on in other cities. It's, I mean, it's all work. It's educational. It's nonstop, um, you know, working groups and seminars and, and things of that sort, and a chance to uh, see what other cities are doing and maybe sometimes bring back some good ideas from, that are working in other cities. And you don't get that chance unless you go meet with the other mayors. So just on that particular thing, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, that is you know, probably a good idea. It's just like professional development and, and building and right. things. And I get and that. And that's twice a year. I get that. Um, but if I were to, I guess, gi uh, give you a more cost-effective way to meet with Congressman Lynch here in Massachusetts, would you take that? Well, I think it was, here's the point, uh, uh, Counselor. Um, I'm not going down there to meet with Congressman Lynch. You're right. I can meet with Congressman Lynch here. Um, but I, uh, I can meet with Kevin Ryan down there, and you know he's the guy that's I'm going to be calling for help. Uh, you know, not not the congressman personally. And the same with the two senators' offices. As a matter of fact, um, you know Senator Markey encouraged me to go down and spend some time with his staff, which I, I've done once, and I I plan to do some more in the future. And we've we've had some uh, great dialogue and brought some great information back. I mean, it's. Uh, you know, well, if, if you if ever want to meet a, with any of our congressional here. delegation here, yeah, I, then I, give me a call. I'm, 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 I'm well aware of what a great job you do for okay. the congressman, Councilor. I just want to make it cost effective just to, okay. to make sure that we're yeah. being fiscally responsible. Yep. It Thank probably you. represents about $1,000 a year. Okay. Thank the Washington you. part. Oh, so we could cut this? Oh, yes, you can cut it. Oh. You can cut anything you want. Thank you, sir. Council, any further questions? No, I'm also. Council Dubois, you. did you have follow ups? I do have one follow up. Um, so I was able to pull up uh, when we did talk about the cable revenue. Mm -hmm. At that time, we did have that thorough discussion where everyone came in and we got the income for the last, oh gosh, I think like 10 years. And I actually have a PDF of it on my phone. And so I added up the income that we got from the cable revenue in 2013, and it added up to around $950,000. And then we gave 550 to the cable company, and the rest went into an account in the mayor's office to be used for um, uh, capital projects. Right. And it's kind of being um, nest egg there so we can take on big capital projects at the cable company. Totally agree with that. Well, and if I could just update sure. you on that, Counselor. Um, and we are working very aggressively with both BCA and Brockton High School on their capital requests. We've got specific requests from both of them. I've been meeting with both of them. And we are prioritizing and itemizing, and you will see substantial distributions from that fund to both BCA and um, Brockton High School for capital projects. Um, the other thing that uh, we need to do is we need to finish restocking the cable advisory board that should be advising me on that, and that is also an immediate goal in the near future. I felt as though I had to start with some of the more critical boards, for less, lack of a better term, uh, like licensing and ZBA and whatever first and work my way through the um, the various boards. I think you're well aware. I think I've sent up over 50 nominees to boards now uh, in the five months that I've been here. Um, but I am very committed to addressing the capital needs both at the BCA side and the Brockton High School side, and you will see those disbursements coming. I appreciate that. But so I do think there needs to be a little due diligence that we don't just hand over a blank check we you know, kind of sign off on what the needs are and that a competitive price has been obtained and you know, what the relative needs are, because there are always needs. So I've, I've asked uh, both the high school and BCA to prioritize for us. Great, but to my point, if we're gonna take, if your, or your office is gonna take $30,000 out of that to pay for a staff member, and we have, I'm assuming if it's increased, I mean, let's say we get the same amount as last year, which is $950,000. Why couldn't your office allocate $60,000 for a technology person at the school department to pay that salary so the $60,000 that would normally go to that person can then be shifted to pay for a school teacher? Because I would vote for that. I yeah, would vote I'm, for that use of funds. I just want you, I think I'd you have to do think some research. I, I'm not even sure if that can be done, but we'll certainly look into it. Okay, but I'm almost done. And I apologize for 
belaboring the point, but I just want to say one more thing. If we can do it for your staff member, we can do it for a school department staff member, because the, 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 what, your, what your argument hung on, I remember it quite clearly, or your side's argument was that uh, revolving fund state law allows you to pay for salary as long as you also pay for the benefit of that salary. And in, because we created a revolving fund for the cable money, that gave you, the, the city, in your argument, the authority to utilize that money for a staff salary. So if we can utilize the money for a staff salary in the mayor's department, we could probably, I think, yes, utilize the money for the school department. It's just an idea right, that I, you sh I would like you to at least consider. Right. That's I, all I'm I, asking I think you to do. One, and I don't disagree with anything you said, but I think you're leaving one small piece out. And we also said that you have to be able to show that that same percentage of that person's duties are related to cable. Sure. So we would have to, that position would have to be designed in a way that sure. they were working on cable-related like activities. Football games or basketball games or anything like that. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Council. Chairman. Council Stewart. Uh, I'll be very brief. So, Mr. Mayor, um, I, this is, outside of being elected the first time, I'd say this is the budget I looked at the closest because I was actually a little amazed that you're able to, what seems to be, continue the services of the city uh, without going to the full levy. So I think that's pretty impressive. I, I am concerned about being able to continue that over the years, but you've addressed that issue that you're going to look at on a yearly basis and figure out where additional revenue is. That's right. Um, I've been impressed by the fact that you've been looking at alternatives for revenue uh, in places that we hadn't done before. So I think you should be commended for that. Uh, and when I look at the, the budget here for your office, it's a really tight, totally underfunded budget. And I will say that I worked for uh, an organization in Boston, as you know, um, several years ago. We had a total budget of $30 million. The budget for my office that I managed was $4 million, and uh, we were servicing a, a much smaller group of people. So the idea that the mayor's office is spending $1.6 million, not all of that on staff, to service a city of 100,000 people, uh, I just can't see where one could argue that the staff is too large or that the spending is too great. And, and, and also, as you pointed out, there's no overtime. Um, so and, and no raises. And no raises. I, I um, you know, pr from my own personal point of view, uh, being charged with you no know, oversight, and I don't feel like my job is to micromanage what, your, what the administration does, but to really look for patterns and trends to figure out where we're going. Uh, and then to ask questions around the validity of the numbers. And uh, frankly, I have some questions for some of the other departments, but mm -hmm. only a few. Um, but particularly for your budget, I, it, I just think what, the, what your team is accomplishing from what I've seen so far um, with the dollars that are being invested is um, we're getting a high return uh, with, frankly, a very small investment. So uh, I appreciate that, Council. I think we've put together a great team of extremely hardworking people that are doing a great job for the residents every day. And if we were to lose one of those people, the residents would, would be impacted. Uh, and I, I do love the idea of, uh, again, of looking at changing the office hours of City Hall um, because we give a lot of lip service to this is a working class city. There's not a lot of folks who have disposable income and we do we do know that if you work on an hourly basis and you have to come to City Hall you have to take off of work and you are impacting the income right. of your family so being able That's to right. open up City Hall in the evening I think is, is fantastic at right. no cost to the city um, I, I just had one question um, around the 21st Century Corp mm -hmm. um, so part of that the funding is really we're we're um, uh, a management company, so to speak, for the rocks. So I want to, so well, for the stadium, for the, for the stadium facility. Me, specifically, yeah. I'm sorry. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because I don't want people to get, I actually have mixed feelings about the role of Rockton 21st Century playing that role so of, don't I. of a landlord, because that's not really what it's, yep. it, its function should be, but that's sort of where the contract is. Mm -hmm. um, and it always upsets me that we spend so little money on economic development in the city. And I've always said, too, that you end up chasing your own tail if you're not putting more money up front to create the right conditions for economic development. Um, and I think my colleague, Mr. Councilman Rodriguez, is right that we do want to consolidate these functions, and you've agreed with that. Um, so what is the plan moving forward with the monies for the economic development side of the 21st Century Corp, but then also this idea that we're property managers? Right. So um, 
I, uh, I agree. I don't think the B-21 is the ideal agency to be managing the stadium. That was designed a long time ago. They needed, uh, I guess they needed a separate agency to pass the funds through. Um, I think actually, you know, long term, I would like to get the stadium out of the B-21. I think it hurts the B-21. I think we've got business leaders in the city right now who are reluctant to get involved in the B-21 that we could really use because they don't want to spend their time messing around managing a stadium. Um, so long term, I would like to see the stadium managed someplace else. Still going to take that $100,000 probably, but um, the idea I'm working with right now would be uh, perhaps expanding the role of the parking authority, and the parking authority could also be a stadium authority. They have a board, they have a director, they have reserves, um, or the council could consider establishing, you know, at some point a separate entity to do it. Um, but I, I do think there's probably, I should say probably, I do think there is a more appropriate entity to oversee the operation of the stadium than the B-21. I think it would be better for the stadium. I think it would be better for the effectiveness of the B-21. So that's absolutely something I'm looking at longer term. Okay. I appreciate it. And again, I've looked really closely at all of these budgets. I, your budget, I think, is probably one of the most efficient in the system, you know, excluding maybe BEMA and some others. But for the most part, for the work that your office is charged to do, spending less than a million dollars to do it on personnel. Well, it's um, actually less than half a million on yeah, personnel. Yeah, frankly, is um, it's just something that people need to get their heads around, that you're running a $300 million budget and a billion dollar operation, and you're spending half a million dollars to, to service the residents of the city. And I don't think there's anything egregious about those numbers there. No, and I'd, I'd be happy to have any of the councils come spend a day in the office. I mean. A lot of my folks come in early, a lot of them stay late, a lot of them work on the weekend. They're extremely committed to what they're doing. Um, you know, other than me, no one over in there is particularly well paid. So um, I, I, I would ask the council to allow me to keep my staff in place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mayor Council, any other questions for the mayor councilors relative to the mayor's department? If not, Council Bonds, do you I'm have sorry. a question? One more, yes. The, sure. cultural, um, the cultural council, or the cultural affairs, it, has that been assigned to someone? Has someone been appointed to that position? I'm just not familiar with the cultural affairs. No, it's not a position. It's a, it's a budget that contributes money towards various cultural events in the city during the course of the year. Oh, okay, because I know it's there used to be a person. You're, you're correct in that. There Gail was Kelly. at one time, and I think actually Mrs. Fitzgerald that was here earlier tonight also had a, that type of job earlier. But um, no, there's no person. That's strictly okay. money that's being passed through to give to different cultural events during the course of the year. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor, anything for the mayor relative to this department? Seeing none, we're going to move on. Agenda item number two. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank Agenda you. item number two, please. Southeastern Regional School, Louis Lopez, Superintendent. Good evening, Superintendent. Let me get my book out of here. Superintendent, thank you for being here tonight. Thank Again, you. Just, uh, all right. <laughs> just for, uh, Information, again, 65% of the student population in Southeastern is from the city of Brockton. And again, we elect two, uh, two representatives on the Southeastern Regional Board, o o Mark Lindy, who's in attendance, and Wayne McAllister, two Brockton residents that serve on the board. Correct. With that, I'll open it up to you, Superintendent. Great, and uh, just to build on that, uh, current enrollment, uh, th 1,356 students, um, That's one 821 of those um, reside in Brockton. Uh, we service somewhere between 16 to 18 percent of the high school age uh, population that resides in Brockton. Um, currently, um, we, we're expanding slightly on our enrollment. Uh, we've had over uh, um, close to 700 applications uh, for admittance in the fall f uh, as freshmen. Uh, 442 of those uh, applications come from Brockton, um, which um, comprises about 35 percent of the eighth graders are applying to Southeastern. Uh, we accept, uh, today we've accepted about 80% of those students. Uh, so we do our best to try to service as many as we can. We have 375 slots, and like I said before, about 700 applicants. Uh, for the seventh year in a row, uh, we're asking for a budget that's at net school spending. We're our, uh, asking our nine communities for no more than the minimum contribution. What that means for the city of Brockton is an increase of 61,319 over the previous year. 
Um, and um, there's also, um, as you can see or have seen, there's an increase in student enrollment as well. And much like uh, what the mayor was saying about the city, um, the enrollment does lag a year. So we have those same kinds of issues. Um, uh, again, I mentioned that we're a minimum contribution. The Chapter 70 formula is based on a special ed population, for example, of 4.75 percent. Our actual special ed population is over 21 percent. So, so we have to deal with those same kind of issues, and we do that in the best way we can. So, with that, I guess I'll open up to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Any questions for Super Councilor Denapoli? Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Superintendent. Uh, I went to your open house. Very much impressed of what was going on in your school. Uh, it's a beautiful school. There's a lot of money that was. Uh, uh, you did renovation, you completely tore the building apart and built right. a new one. And uh, I want to thank you very much. And I also, I have to give kudos for uh, Mr. Wheeler, your principal, mm -hmm. who lives across the street from me. <laughs> thank you very much for your assistance in helping the residents of Ward 5 uh, to get into your school, and I appreciate that. And I just uh, want to say you continue doing a good job. You're welcome. Thank you. And just as a quick aside, the $33 million renovation, we were able to do that. No increase in assessments to any of the communities. So we were able to do that out of our own revenue and 80% state reimbursement. So. That's awesome. Anything else, Superintendent? Council Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jesus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, I just have a quick question for you. I see on the, uh, on the submission, on the uh, worksheet that you submitted to us, it seems that the, um, the communities closest to Brockton, something like East Bridgewater and Easton, you asked them for a lot less money from them. Uh, is it because the enrollment from those communities are down or is it because you wanted to give them a break and then kind of yeah, uh, just to answer real quick, it, it's it's very it's it's based on the Chapter 70 uh, net uh, state aid formula, and, and in in the case of East Bridgewater, there's a sharp decline in enrollment. As some of you may know, they just finished their school about a year ago, so that wasn't unexpected. Um, that's the reason for there, and the the, uh, the other big um, for East Bridgewater is one of those communities that gets revenue from target sharing, so that that's one of the communities that is getting increased state aid. So as a result, their assessment is down. Uh, Brockton on the other side of the fence, um, according to the state aid, the chapter 70 former is paying less. So that's why uh, you're seeing in a small scale at Southeastern and a very large scale you know, for the Brockton Public School because they're trying to ramp up your assessment. According to the state formula, they're saying that the city can afford more, which obviously, you know, that's one of the issues you guys are discussing, but uh, so that's the reason why you're seeing that Easton has a, uh, is the same and um, I'm Trying to think of the other community. I think uh, Foxborough and Sharon are in that same boat as well How affected would the uh, your system be if we did not uh, If we just basically level funded your uh, budget for for what was it funded in 2014 and 2015 how affect how, how would that affect your uh, how detrimental would that be to your system? Uh, well, we're currently, um, our increase is, is 1.7%, uh, even though we've had an a, uh, increase in enrollment. Um, so, so, and again, we're at net school spending. So, so realistically, uh, the question is, what, what would that mean to the city if you contributed less than minimum contribution? I think that's a, that's a question. Um, and, and our budget uh, needs to be passed by, um, uh, two-thirds um, uh, of the communities and uh, we do have have unanimous uh, approval by the other communities so in effect you know we could do that um, our uh, we're taking over 50 percent of our excess and deficiency which is our only reserve account to fund the budget uh, so so in terms of devastation uh, we're, we're getting critically low on that so so the, the the school committee arguably would have to go back and figure out how they could you know, could they generate that $61,000 in revenue in another, another way? Um, a lot of that, but, uh, by the way, is regional transportation. Uh, if, if the state um, um, held their commitment to reimburse the communities 100% of transportation, like they're supposed to under law, you actually would be seeing a decrease in assessment. So uh, that's one of the ways that we could, um, we could try to lobby for, for a, 
uh, some relief to the city. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councilor. Anybody else for the Superintendent? Councilor. Good evening, Superintendent. Um, I have a question. What does e, uh, LEA stand for on one of your sheets? LEA is the um, is the local education aid, uh, agency. So 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 you see, um, um, it just stands for 44 is Brockton. So okay. it's it's uh, it's the code, and it's just this is a spreadsheet. So if I type in a different code, it gives me a different spreadsheet. So that's what that is. So they're just codes. That's the code for Brockton L, uh, 44. So if you, if you're looking, you know, want to look up the Brockton School District. Chapter 78, what they get, what their enrollment is, you know, that's, that's the number, 044. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Isaac. Councilor, is anything else for the superintendent? Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item number three, Madam Clerk. School Department, Kathleen Smith, superintendent. Good evening, Superintendent. Good evening. Uh, good evening to all the counselors. Uh, it is indeed a privilege to come before you tonight, having been a Brockton Public School teacher and employee for the past 37 years. In listening to all of you this evening, uh, and, and I've lived among you for 30 years, I know your families, I know your children, uh, I've worked beside you in, in many endeavors that, that involve our school system. To hear you talk about Brockton, we all know that when we hear the good things that are happening in this city, it starts with the schools. One of the things that I have come to understand is that what you expect from the Brockton Public Schools is no less than excellence. And excellence is what we give you. We give you that for our special needs students. Families move into this district because of what you offer for those children. Some of our newest families coming from many, many countries come here because of the services that we provide to English language learners and their families. For the students that are your high achieving students, you provide AP classes, IB classes, you provide all kinds of offerings so that your students can remain competitive. And that is why families come, and that is why families stay. We also provide, because of our large urban district, we have stayed away from the haves and the have-nots. We have not instituted fees to take part in sports. We have not instituted fees to, to park in the parking lot. We have made sure, whether it's an after-school program, to level the playing field for academic support so every youngster can attain that competency certification. Those diplomas, you gave out 888 diplomas on Saturday. You gave them out to... them out to regular education students, you gave them out to multiple pathway students so that every student has an opportunity to succeed, postgraduate, college, world of work, military, and for that we are very, very proud. I started to work on this budget actually when I became superintendent. I met with Aldo Petroni, our chief, <laughs> chief budget officer, every Friday. And the mayor is correct when he talks to you about the challenges. I have been very open with the counselors in having some opportunity. Most recently, we met on May 5th. We had a legislative luncheon. I know it was during the, the working hours. I thank those counselors that were able to come. There were many counselors that asked for the information, and I made sure that it was in your hands, because the mayor is correct. We are facing difficult times. There's information uh, for you about our Title I services based on a census. We are definitely uh, underreported in a census. Uh, we know that there are more than 100,000 residents in the city of Brockton and certainly more children in, in our schools than the census uh, would let us know. That has been a decrease in funding over many, many years. We've seen that coming. We rely very heavily on state and federal grants. And yes, it is true that recently, uh, in the first years of the Obama administration, when things were very, very difficult, Deval Patrick was a new governor. They made sure that with Race to the Top money, our funding, it has kept us afloat for a number of years. As I told you, in looking at this budget, 
One of the things I did as a new superintendent for probably the past eight months is I worked on what is called an entry plan, and I also made sure that that was in your hands this past weekend. And an entry plan has a superintendent go out into the community. I met with hundreds of your constituents. I met with parents. I met with a youth voice. I met with administrators that worked in the schools. I met with teachers. I met with paras. I met with custodians. I met with monitor teacher assistants. I met with numbers of you to talk about the strengths of our district, what are the challenges of our district, and what are those things that we cannot do without. So again, when I hear us talk about bringing in businesses, I agree with that. I live here. There's nothing more important than to be able to support your schools. But in listening to what our community wants, looking at the budget that I'm going to speak to you about tonight, it is devastating. And looking again at the first superintendent's budget that I had in your packet uh, was the superintendent's recommended budget of $173 million. And as your superintendent, I would be remiss if I didn't tell the school committee, the mayor, what I need to run the Brockton Public Schools. And when you talk about additional students, you are talking about in the past two years an addition of close to 1,000 students. That's the size of one or two brand new schools. These are students that come through our doors every single day. In that budget, I talked about increasing cultural proficiency for our families and our students, setting up advocacy centers for our bilingual parents, our special education parents, again, to build support, to build capacity, to build volunteerism among our parents so they feel comfortable in our schools, they can support our children's education. I talked about building around the city, opportunities for parents, north, south, east, and west, to come and to learn the English language so that they, again, can support their students. We talked about class size, a growing class size, needing to pay attention to some of the mandates, again, with our bilingual and our special education students, and not to put any of those programs at risk. So when you looked at that superintendent's budget, it was by no means a wish list. It might have been something that is difficult for us to afford as a city, but you needed to see what it would take to continue to move our district forward with unprecedented mandates happening in the state, opportunities for educator evaluation, district determined measures, PARC versus MCAS, accountability statuses that I have shared with the school committee the city of Brockton needs to pay attention to. You have been very, very fortunate because of your excellent teaching staff, your excellent support staff, that you are the only urban district that is what is called a level three district. <laughs> but that being said, when I spoke to the school committee recently, this past February, in looking at our information as it came in, you have done an excellent job of supporting two of the schools that were teetering a couple of years ago between level three and level four, your Huntington School. As a, a city, we put forward $300,000 for an extra hour for a school that has 90% free and reduced lunch youngsters, has a large number of bilingual youngsters. When you put that $300,000, what you did was you also empowered that staff Principal June Saber and her staff to come up with another $750,000 for three year in an expanded learning time grant. That was because of the money that you put forward. They have stayed out of and continue to improve. They have stayed out of level four status. You did the same for East Middle School. We have a redesign grant. Principal Kelly Silver is working with her staff to turn around that school. And you have three other schools that are teetering on this accountability. The Raymond School, 1,100 youngsters, K to 8. The Arnon School, the Baker School. And when you looked at that superintendent's budget, it was to look at interventionists, additional support services, similar to things that we've done at the Huntington and East Middle School to make sure that those schools stayed out of level four status. I do agree with, again, the mayor. Uh, when you then looked at what I call a level services budget, when you talk about what has happened at the state level, and I'm not going to continue to reiterate some of the things that have been told to you, the mayor was correct when he told you that a year ago we had an additional 450 youngsters. And with those youngsters to the city of Brockton came an additional $11 million. 
Of that $11 million, the school district saw about $6 million, and yes, in fact, that is based on Schedule 19. I've had deep conversations with Jay Condon. I thank him for his support. He has been at every single finance meeting we have had. He has answered some very, very difficult questions, and he and I continue to have dialogue about Schedule 19. But when you talk about this year, we had another increase of close to 439 youngsters. You would assume that we would have another $11 million. And when I tell you that I worked closely with Aljo Petronio from September on, we were looking at that October 1st amount of students. We were anticipating $11 million coming in, and it truly is on the backs of those children. So when we looked at what came in this year, the mayor is correct in telling you there was an inflation factor that downright hurt us. Instead of $11 million, we saw $8.5 million come in, and it came in on the backs of students. And what I'm here to tell you is when the mayor tells you that you have had an increase from last year's budget to this year's budget, that is true. But that $3.7 million that we saw out of the $8.5 million is that increase, and that's on the backs of students. We did have uh, additional costs. You know, the mayor mentioned loss of rates to the top, step, rate, step raises, additional personnel. When I have a student move in that has a special education IEP and requires a one-on-one, -on -one, I need to immediately hire a monitor, teacher, assistant, a para. It is mandated by law that we provide those services during the school year to families that move into the city, costs that we don't anticipate. Um, we talked about the loss of race to the top funding. This past year, you experienced ex exactly what we did. We had a difficult winter, just like everybody else in this city putting oil in their tanks, gas in their cars. We know what those increases are. So when I talk about a level services budget, the level services budget, if I were to open the doors this September, similar to last September, never mind the additional students that we just talked about, 439. From October 1st until now, I have another 300 students sitting in front of me. And at the rate that we hear about planning in the city, I'm hearing about the boulders opening. I'm hearing about Trinity Project opening. I'm hearing tonight about additional building going on. I want to know where I'm placing those students and how I'm funding those students' education. <laughs> When the mayor uh, handed me my budget on May 9th, uh, he and I have had some serious conversation. We committed to working together, and as difficult as it has been, we have continued to have conversations. I'm sure we will continue to try to work together. But I have to tell you how difficult it was at that point to give out 199 what are called pink slips or reduction in force notices. And it was because of a contractual mandate of May 15th that I needed to let teachers know where they stood for the coming year. And yes, I did not anticipate that that would remain 199 teachers being laid off. But I had to make up a $6 million shortfall when you're talking just a level services budget to the budget that the mayor gave me, which was $160 million from level services. That is a $6 million shortfall. We immediately went back to work, and I do have to thank and compliment the educational leadership that you have in your school committee, our elected officials. They have stood by me. They have worked together with me. We have met on Saturdays. We have met on Sundays. We have met after hours. The time that they have committed to the children and to the families of Brockton should be applauded by each and every person here tonight. Two things I want to share with you. So in order to look at 199 teachers being reduction in force, uh, pink slipped, one of the things I committed immediately was to look at the district as a whole, and this was painful. I call it the first round of cuts to start to bring back, I have to protect the instructional core. And I ask you to look around, and all of you read the papers, you listen to newsreels, you know that places like Lawrence, which has gone into receivership, their schools have been taken over by the state. 
you know that New Bedford presently has one school taken over by the state. So in looking at what I had to preserve, my priority was to preserve what was happening in the classroom, to preserve class size, to make sure there was a qualified teacher sitting in front of every one of those students. But that being said, the next most difficult thing happened was looking at the rest of the system and make no mistake about it. When I tell you I've been here 37 years, some of the best people that keep your school system going, and you know these are people that live and work in our city, and like me at 37 years, they've committed to you 20 years, 30 years, 25 years. Those are your custodians, your administrative assistants, your paraprofessionals, your monitor teacher assistants, and your people that aren't represented by any union. So as painful as that was, we were back to the drawing board trying to make up a $6 million shortfall, trying to deal with growth. And we ended up giving out another 73 reduction in force pink slips that have put people on notice that, that we're not sure when we'll be able to have them come back. But I want you to hear the effects of what a $160 million budget is doing to our Brockton public schools. Here is the impact. Increased class sizes across the board. That is elementary, which we've had the largest growth, to middle school, to our Brockton High School. District accountability status in jeopardy, and that's my talk to you again about level three to level four schools. Facility maintenance and space needs. I have talked from the time that I was interviewed about a facility master plan. Because one of the things, and before I end tonight, I will talk to you about next steps but I need you to see what I'm seeing in the schools. And before I talk about that, I again want to thank our Deputy Superintendent Mike Thomas, his office, who has brought millions and millions of dollars to Brockton for renovations on roofs, on boilers. We actually just got good news, the mayor and I received news that four out of six of the projects that Mike put forth this, this past spring have been allowed to be funded at, again, an 80% to 20%. <laughs> Those are the Ashfield School. That's our new Barrett Russell School for Windows. I believe that's the Gilmore School. And the last one, Mr. Thomas, is the Brookfield School. So you can see it spans the city, but I need you to see what I'm seeing. I go to the Kennedy School. I walk in those modular classrooms. They were supposed to have a lifespan of 10 years. I was a parent when it first opened of a sixth grader. I was excited. It was brand new. It was air conditioned. It, it was the place, if you were at the Kennedy School, it was the place you wanted your child to be. I ask you to walk through those classrooms now. To me, there's even a safety concern. It was meant to last 10 years. We've had them lasting 20 years. You have students in classrooms in the Kennedy which we are under order. We have bilingual students sharing classes, a fourth and a fifth grade split. Our goal was to come together this year in one of the first budgets that I presented, not only to have a facility master plan, so we're actually planning 20 years out, deciding what we want for our children, increased technology needs, how are they going to be able to be competitive, what kinds of schools do you want your youngsters in. And before I leave tonight, I want to invite you to join me whether it's this fall or as soon as possible on what I call a bus tour. I'd love you to join me on a Saturday. I'd love to highlight some of the facilities. So I'm not standing up here talking to you. You actually get to see what I get to see every day and the kinds of things that we need to come together and take care of. Our staff and cuts include after looking at our programmatic cuts, we are able to bring back at this point about 170 of the teachers that we have laid off. That is with a growing enrollment, that is not good enough for me. We have 36 teachers and administrators that remain uh, unfunded, programs remain unfunded. Two executive directors and an early childhood coordinator. And what I want to do is, uh, again, dispel some of the rumors going around. When I did come on as superintendent, one of the things that I continually heard about was to restore some of the positions that continue to allow us to be competitive. One of the positions I restored first was an executive director for your middle schools, and you have your multiple pathways, your so-called alternative schools. Those programs needed attention. 
We needed to be part of our Office of Teaching and Learning. We also, in that first budget, paid attention to bringing back an early childhood coordinator. You, have, you are the only urban district without an early childhood coordinator. So when we talk about our birth date, our December 31st birth date for entering kindergarten, that's a concern for our city. Not enough of a concern that I'm willing to let those children not be in classes. We're waiting for preschool dollars to come in. We're waiting to make sure that if there are resources out there, we can start to pay attention to that three-year-old, that four-year-old, and find space for them so that by the time they're in the third grade, they're reading on level, and they're set in a direction so that they can be successful students, something very important that we need in the district. We also, um, again, have 73 staff still out. I mentioned to you, custodians, administrative assistants, paraprofessionals, MTAs, non-union staff. We have cut middle school sports and Brockton High School into murals. And I want you to know, this wasn't just done in a back room. I brought directors in. I brought principals in. We had lengthy discussions line by line in the item. And it was very difficult to talk about what could go. All of these programs that make us what we're proud of a 20% cut to the uh, clubs at Brockton High School. $2 million in technology cut that we continue to cut each and every year. And when you look at those wealthier communities, not only do those children, many of them have one-on-one -on -one devices, but they have opportunities because their communities, I understand, are wealthy. And what they can do is when they reach foundation and the superintendent comes before them and says, we're entering an era of a, a new a new type of testing, PARP, online assessments. They can give an additional million dollars. We have done an excellent job through grants and some support, but we cannot keep cutting that budget every year, this year by $2 million, so our children will never be competitive. <laughs> With over 1,400 teachers, we cut our substitute budget, which is over a million dollars a year. We cut it by 250,000 students. You should be concerned about that because what we have decided, this is not educationally sound. I'm uncomfortable standing here talking to you about it because I will have at the high school, when a teacher is out, I will have some students sitting in a cafeteria. They'll have expanded study time because I will not have a teacher able to step into that classroom if I want a teacher there full time. And th those were the choices that I had to make. Another difficult, difficult cut for me. Many of you that know me through my time as the director of community schools. When I come on in 2001, one of the mandates, and Councillor Stewart, you sat with me on that board, was that every child would have an opportunity for after school. Not just our 21st century students, but we committed as a school district that those students that were not part of 21st century grant school after school funding would have an opportunity. We have just cut that system wide cut it out by 350,000 students. So our students in schools that are not 21st century, that had that opportunity for academic support programs, extracurricular programs, fun things to do after school, and many times for those working parents made a difference in the lives of those children, cut by $350,000. Elimination, as I talked to you about the Kennedy School modular classrooms, total elimination of the replacement of those classrooms at this time. And quite honestly, you know, looking down my list, making sure I've touched on all of them, one of the things that the school committee spoke to me about at the recent uh, school committee meeting on June 3rd, when I told them that I would still have a number of teachers that were not able to be brought back on that first round of cuts, they ask the superintendent to go back to the drawing board and to continue to look for additional cuts. And here's what those additional cuts are. We have our first finance subcommittee meeting uh, on June 11th. And at this point here, we were back to the drawing board on Friday. And when I talk painful, I'm talking again, another $220,000 in parent liaisons that we brought on back in 2001. And when you brought those on, that was your connection between the home and the school. That parent liaison works 19.5 hours, and it's what they're paid for. They work many hours beyond that. They work with the principals. They work. <laughs> they help with family fun nights. They help with fundraisers. They are truly that connection between the home and school. 
I'll be talking about freshman sports that I will present to the school committee on June 11th. And I, I am here to tell you that another most difficult cut is to look up at the high school, our award-winning high school. Those of you that got to see the musical this past May and probably go every single year to see the talent that is on those stages. You watch our marching band. Those of you that marched with me in that Memorial Day parade, how proud are we when that band plays and people say, this is a high school band? I called, I called Mr. Vinnie Macrina and we are looking at cutting the fine arts. I'm not sure how deep we will have to go, but I have to come up with another $950,000 in cutting this budget. I want to remind you that when I talk about the lows, I will talk about the highs, because a number of you were there for the graduation on Saturday, and I've already spoken about the accomplishments of that class. But I will tell you that last Tuesday night, we had the opportunity with many parents and people in the community to look at some of the awards and accolades. Perfect MCAS scores, 13 in English language arts and 20 in math rivals many of your high-performing districts. Award-winning band, chorus, fine arts, drama, JROTC, 290 John and Abigail Adams scholarship winners brought to high school. Brockton High School, U.S. News and World Reports, a bronze winner for the fourth time. And that happens because you've always supported that high school. school distinction for our Huntington School, which is clearly a turnaround school and our Brockton High continually. You offer, again, advanced placement, international baccalaureate program offerings from sixth grade through twelfth grade. We have a collaboration, a professional development partner with Bridgewater State University. You have NIAC accreditation at the uh, Angelo and our unknown school for our youngest learners. We're nationally recognized as a trauma-sensitive schools, and this past November, Secretary of Education, former Superintendent Dr. Matt Malone, joined us and gave an award to our schools at the Baker School. Because let me tell you, what happens in the evenings and the struggles that our wonderful police department struggles with each and every night, when crime happens, many times those children are in those homes. It doesn't happen where there aren't children. You can look at recently the uh, parent that was murdered on Forest Ave. We not only that day had the kindergartners sitting at the Gilmore School with our principal and staff, we had two youngsters at South Middle School. Those principals, those teachers stayed there with them until 6 o'clock, and we are prepared to deal with that trauma and all of the trauma that our children come to us each and every day. And when we do talk about deficits, one of the things that we have to look at, but I want you to understand, over the past couple of years, we've had an increase in homeless students in the city of Brockton. From about three to 400 to presently, 500 homeless students are in our city. And each and every day, our teachers give them that extra breakfast, making sure they get lunch, making sure they have after school programs, making sure they're tied into other agencies to support those children. Nobody does it better. And I know time is, is difficult right now, and you have a, a long four nights ahead of you. But I do want to talk about next steps, because I'm not going away. And when I say that, I mean that. I mean that respectfully. And what I mean by that is, when we were talking about the legislative luncheon that we had, I talked very openly. And I did not realize I had to be actually, I think, a resolve to come before the council. And one of the things I said was, I think it's important for the school superintendent every year to do a state of the school's address, not when it's a budget season. I need to share with you the difficulties we are dealing with with funding. I need to be telling you the good news. I need to be telling you about a grants office that right now is working to make sure there's not a federal grant out there that we're not looking at, a state grant. We're positioning ourselves to make sure that there is no dollar left on the table. I want you to know for next steps, I will continue to work with our uh, school committee, 
We'll look at different ways for efficiencies to provide the high quality services and constraints that we have under the, the current budget. I mentioned identifying new grants and foundation funding streams, working with businesses. I actually serve uh, on the board of directors of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and recently had an opportunity to listen to many of the members there were talking and their bank presidents and their business owners. And I know that they're struggling. They were putting a good face on how difficult it is to recover from this recession. But the one thing when I got to talk about the schools, and I'm going to say it to you again, we can talk all we want. But people are coming to this city. One of the first things they look at before they buy, before they build, before they frequent our shops. What is the city like to come in? What are we known for? And again, that is your excellent award-winning school system. Yeah. In closing, I agree with the mayor. I agree that we need to come together. I've been talking to everybody that will listen to me that once we get through this very difficult budget season, we need to sit down with our, with our legis legislative delegation. We need to sit down with the mayor, with the superintendent, with other gateway cities, with other cities that are facing some of the same difficulties we are. Because Brockton, if you recall, and I was around back in 1980 when Webby versus Dukakis came up because Robin Webby, a student that was sitting at Brockton High School, didn't have adequate books, had 36 kids in a class, and they were sitting on radiators. The Webby versus Dukakis soon turned into the Jamie McDuffie case. I thought it was McDuffie Weld. Somebody told me today it was McDuffie, I believe, Robertson, who uh, I believe was the commissioner of education at the time. But Jamie McDuffie is a teacher in our school system today, and again, she encountered some of those same things, was our lead plaintiff. And we made a difference. Ed reform came in, whether we like the Chapter 70 funding formula, and we don't here in Brockton, I agree with that. So this is not the time to sit back. It is the time to start to say, if we need equity, if we don't want to be in the same situation each year, we need to come together. I've talked to uh, Councillor um, Sullivan about the June 19th meeting that you already have scheduled with the school committee and our city council. And I'm asking you at that time, if we start to discuss a task force and what are the next steps so we're not walking away after a difficult budget season. And I will leave you with this. I am a taxpayer in this city along with being your superintendent of schools. And I am standing here to tell you, although I don't, don't think this is a quick fix, and I understand the difficulties, but when you talk about the opportunity to raise taxes 2.5%, which is allowed, I am standing here telling you that, as Councilor Cruz said, if this is what the Band-Aid takes right now, we need every bit of support that we can get from the mayor, from the city, and I'm asking the city council to please come up with a way to support the needs that I have just shared with you this evening. Thank you, super. Thank you, Superintendent. You had that passion in law school when we were students together, too, and I like to see it. I, I just want to reiterate again, counselors and everybody here, this is not the city council budget. If the city council has its way, there wouldn't be one pink slip for any teacher, and I can say that for all 11 of us. This is the budget that was presented to the city council, and we have to try to vet it out and work through it. So I just want to be clear, because I think there's some misunderstanding with some people that the city council can save jobs. City council can only deal with what it was presented here. So with that being said, Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Superintendent Smith. Great presentation. Um, and probably in a just in time, you're getting a little hoarse there. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, obviously, you know what I feel about whether we were to increase to the 2.5% levy. And I, I happen to think we should. But uh, uh, that isn't something we can do. But in the, the bigger picture, explain to me if you can, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but the Webby case basically came down to the, the court saying that lower income communities had to be basically given the same opportunities 
as the, as those cities and towns that had that were more wealthy. Correct? Is that? That's certainly it, it was equity. And, and what and you saw point, in the advent in the advent of accountability coming in, where every student needed to pass MCAS in order to receive their high school diploma. That came in in 1993 with about a 10 year span that gave us an opportunity to get our resources in place, for the funding to come in with a full foundation budget. And for a number of years, it did help. Obviously, you know, you, I, put the, I put in your possession the book that Dr. Susan Sackowitz wrote about the transformation of Brockton High School. And that was done again because of the monies that were committed through Chapter 70 funding to make sure that there was equity between whether a student sits in Brockton or they sit in West Bridgewater or they sit in Easton, that they have those same opportunities for a high quality education. And so it appears to me now, and again, the school committee works with you, you know, closely on this, but it appears to me now that the state has shirked or walked away or lowered the Chapter 70 funding for students in, well, like, like Gateway City seems to be the catch-all phrase we use now. Is that correct? It is, and I've talked to Mr. Condon about this, who understands the foundation budget better than anybody. And when you look at some of our high-need students, doesn't cover the cost of special education, what we get in that foundation formally. Doesn't cover the cost of what it takes to educate a bilingual youngster. Doesn't cover the cost of, of, again, when you talk about some of our neediest youngsters, our general ed youngster. So the foundation formula is flawed. That is correct. So that's the formula they're using. But the court order said that the, that the state will, will make cities like Brockton make their students have an equal opportunity for that full, full education. That's correct. And it also, that case, when, when that case ended, we kept the case open, and again, I think many of you will know after that it was called the Hancock case, to make sure that each entity of government, their feet were held to the fire to make sure that there was continued equity in funding. And the case ended up getting closed. Had it remained, we might have been able to go back to that well again and start to talk well, about the difficulties we're facing. Well, that's my question. Should we be going back again? Well, that's, that's what we talked about with next steps, Councillor Cruz. And as I told you, when I said I'm not going away, that is the next step. I'm not. Councillors, unfortunately, and, and I'm a lawyer, right? And we could talk about lawsuits and pending lawsuits and the McDuffie case and the Hancock case and the Webby case. And I know Robin Webby, but that's not what's before us. We have to talk about, this is a budget hearing. We have to talk about the budget. I'd be happy to sponsor a resolve to have the superintendent come in. I, she's already offered to do that. We can talk about this. We can bring the solicitor in. But what is our duty, our fiduciary duty tonight and for the next few nights is to talk about this, this budget. So let's do that and we'll bring the superintendent in. She was, I met with her today for two hours. She was nice enough to say she wants to come in either, either monthly or quarterly to give us updates. I think that's brilliant. Let's do it. But let's move on. Standpoint. Hi, Mr. President. Mr. Chairman, I'll be filing a resolve to have the law department and you in soon to, uh, that we'll have to start that court case again. And uh, in the meantime, obviously, the only thing we can do is cut. So I don't know what else we'll have to talk to you about. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Dubois, thank followed you by so Council Ayaneri. Thank you for being here, um, Superintendent. I really appreciate it. I take everything that you say very seriously and the position that we're in seriously. So um, I'm looking at your budget, and so I'm seeing that you have a shortfall of your, you're saying 5.7 million. Is that still what you're closing on if you wanted to get, uh, explain that a little bit more? Well, again, I go back to in order to open the doors in September the way that we did this past year, the budget would have to be in the area of $166 million. Yep. So when you talk about a shortfall, when we were given a budget of just over $160 million on net school spending, one of the first things we had to do was deal with that $6 million shortfall. And that was, as I shared with you, the giving out of 199 pink slips, knowing that I would then have to go back to the board immediately and look at programmatic cuts, ordinary maintenance cuts, cuts to other employee unions, uh, non-union personnel, to the tune of, as I said, 73 additional pink slips were giving out uh, beyond the teacher pink slips. We also identified over 2.1 uh, million in programmatic cuts, and, and I'm not sure if you want me to go through all of those cuts right now. 
we looked at another $400,000 in ordinary maintenance. So we had about $5.4 million that we could now work with to start to, when it all added up, that all added up to about $11 million. Obviously, we had to make up that $6 million shortfall. In addition, I had about another $5.4 million to now start to bring jobs back. Okay. And what we identified, you heard me speak tonight, about coming up with, at this point here, 170 of those 199 jobs that directly impact the classroom were the first wave of, of wanting to bring back those teachers that, that uh, are directly working with students and implicate instruction in the classroom. So that you, still leaves out 29 teachers and 73 other personnel along with all of the other cuts that I just shared with you to make up that deficit. Okay, so um, from the 166 million, I'm seeing that you requested 173 million. That's what you think you need to run it properly. Is that what you're saying? I, I will, again, I did mention that in what I say about the superintendent's budget. I don't want to call it a wish list, yeah. but it's expensive and it is extravagant for a city, an urban center like Brockton. But it's incumbent upon your superintendent every year to make sure that you as a city council, yes. to make sure the mayor, to make sure the school committee knows what does it take to run the school district so we stay out of accountability status, our students can achieve and receive high school diplomas, and in a city like Brockton, how do we empower parents to be part of the process? So that's what that $173 million reflected. Sure, and I honestly, I really appreciate that because when my husband and I look at our budget, we do the same thing. So we look at everything that we want, including vacations, and then we pair it back from there. So would you say it's comparable to that, where you're sitting down with your household budget and you're looking at everything? Every, you might need a new car, you could put it off, but you put it in the budget to try to see if you can find it. Okay, and so then you got down to the budget that you said, if we open up the doors, we need 166 million to avoid layoffs and to maintain level services at 166 million? Or are you saying that even at 166 million, you were projecting some cuts? Well, when you talk about level services, you do talk about opening the doors the same as it was last September. But unfortunately, one of the things you heard us talk about was growth. So we had 439 new students since October 1st. From October 1st until June 1st, we have had another 300 youngsters that came in in the middle of the year. So for me to talk about level services, we requested additional buses because the children have to be bused. We requested additional teachers because the children need to be taught. Additional uh, positions with our bilingual department. There were additional positions with our spe special education department. There was the early childhood coordinator to pay attention to our youngest students. All of that was not included in a level services budget. All right, so now you get to a $6 million deficit and you sit down with your team and you identify 11 million worth of potential cuts so then you and your team can sit down and choose of that 11 million that you've identified as potential cuts, what cuts are gonna add up to the 6 million that you're gonna force and what are the ones that you're gonna be able to stop? Correct. It, not include, okay. So where we're standing right now, you've included these cuts, you've enumerated them to us. Um, and I'm trying to get to a point that, so the only way I can see this working, um, what would you do if the city council were to deny this budget and send it back to the mayor and ask him to raise taxes to regenerate around $2.5 million and somehow, like through God's grace, it was given to the school department. It would be a really, this is a far-fetched thought. I but understand. I just want to get an idea from you. If that $2 million or $2.5 million were to be allocated for the school department, how would you be able to bridge that? Who could you bring back? And then what would you do next year? in order to you know, plug that hole that's, so we weren't in the same position? That's an excellent question. And one of the first things that we would do is I do need to maintain integrity in the classroom for all of the reasons I told you. So in order to bring those 29 teachers back, uh, the other thing, Councillor Dubois, is I have set priorities with the school committee. So we talked about these very things. One of the first things that we talked about were compliance, looking at 
I don't want to have the state in here looking at special education, looking at non-compliance with bilingual. I uh, made that my first priority, and that would be not just bringing back those 29 teachers. Many of them have monitor teacher assistants, paras, that support some of those one-on-ones, some of those IEPs. So I would first look at compliance. The second thing I would look at is maintaining integrity in class size and school size. That would be my second priority. My next priority, again, would be to look at the overall management of the buildings. You know, looking at, again, custodial services, looking at facility needs, looking at your administrative assistants that support each and every day what happens in your schools and at our central administration office. So we have set a priority list for how we would bring back programs. If you, again, if you levy taxes and we were able to have an influx of money into the schools, that exactly what we would stick to. We would go back and immediately look at personnel, look at compliance, look at class size, look at school size, look at organizational management in the schools. And I will tell you this, whether I liked it or not, because a year ago, I sat here when Interim Superintendent John Jerome came before you. I think you had two questions for him. It was a very easy budget. It was at that time that I basically said to John, and you all wanted to ask him good questions about the schools, and it wasn't the time to do that. And that's when I had suggested coming before and doing a state of the schools address so that you would understand some of the things we're dealing with. So to come before you with such deep cuts, um, it, it has been very, very painful. And the way that we would bring some of these programs back is just as we cut them, I would start to bring in the principals, bring in the directors. And as I said, whether I liked it or not, it made me look at every single item in that budget. And I did not do this alone. So this was with our executive team. This was with our school committee. This was with bringing principals in, bringing directors in. What can you do without? And if you could see the look on their faces when we talked about, again, middle school sports, and I'm going to tell you a story, that while we're sitting there making those painful cuts that day, Aldo Petronio was there on his phone because his young son, Dylan, was playing West, and Cliff Murray, our executive director and principal from West, was watching between Pluff and West and in great competition. And all the things that you want to see for those kids before they eventually become teammates up at Brockton High School. So it was very, very difficult to sit there and be cutting out middle, middle school sports, watching a parent and a principal so excited about children having those opportunities. So are there any nurses cut in this budget? There are a number of nurses cut. Again, that is obviously a priority, and that is for compliance. That is for students that have uh, IEPs, medication issues. I know, went to a um, workshop this weekend that had a gentleman from Philadelphia with a power group there that's dealing with very uh, difficult funding of their school system. And they've had two students die last year from asthma attacks and another attack where there was no nurse to help that student and they are using that as a leverage to get more funding at the state but it's sad that that is a potential will we have nurses in every school you have a nurse in every school and in those 170 we immediately brought nurses back yeah it's very very scary and that is would be a devastating not that all the cuts aren't devastating but um and then um I just want to make sure I get all my questions. Okay, my one final thing is so I live, I represent Ward 6 and I live there um, and I've spoken to multiple developers and I've been told that Ward 6 is um, the highest developed, um, is, has the most construction going on. Um, right now there are around 169 uh, apartments being constructed off of, the, off of East Ashland Street. I fought that tooth and nail with multiple residents, some who are here tonight and the city push it down our throats. Um, two nights ago, I was with uh, 40 residents that went before the Zoning Board of Appeals um, to have a senior residential community that had been permanent in the city um, for uh, 36 homes, changed to regular housing, and from two bedrooms for over 55, they are now gonna be four bedroom homes. So you can imagine how many children are gonna be living in those. The residents asked for no change, and the Zoning Board of Appeals under its new um, construction jammed it down their throat 
notes and gave them no concession, no respect, no help. Um, and then I per there are going to be 12 more four-bedroom homes built on the site that used to be the Franklin School. And I know of 12 other four-bedroom homes currently in construction. So that adds up to my estimate close to 510 new children in just Ward 6. And so um, I appreciate, and I'm every time I go before these boards, that's what I say to them. When you figure out the tax rate, because they say that they're going to be around $350,000, and you do the math, um, in your own estimation, we're spending um, how much per student, did you say? I think it's in the I, book. Right. On average, uh, Brockton spends, uh, well, per pupil expenditure is about $12,000. So the most we're going to get from these homes is $5,000 a year. And if they have more than one child, we are more or less paying developers to build homes for the rest of us to be able to not afford to educate the Constance, children. We're going to stay on point about the budget. Yeah. Not it, any projections of future growth right now. I we're think talk that's about the fair. Budget. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very much. So it's just it's just concerning. So if so, say the world works out and everything happens the way we want it to, and somehow you get 2.5 million dollars through s denial of this budget lobbying the mayor to raise taxes, that all comes to fruition. What happens next year? How are we not in the same position next year? And, and the mayor brought that up, and, and I agree with him that we need to be talking again to our legislative group. We need to be proactive, and, and I mentioned to you the, the June 19th date, to really start to understand the budget now before we're dealt with, because if you look at that inflation factor, it was on the backs of students, but as I said to you, for just about the same number of students a year ago, you had an $11 million increase. This year you had 8.5, there's your $2.5 million. Yeah. So this is no one's fault. Next yeah. year the inflation might be better, but I think we'll be on top of it, we'll be watching it, and we'll be advocating for, for certainly some reprieve for what we're dealing with uh, as an urban center, dealing with a very needy student population. And I do know, just to answer part of the question that I asked myself, that there's a lot of movement right now at the State House around funding for education. And I'm talking to people that are running for governor saying that they believe that this new calculation is going to be passed by next year. Do you see any, any of that on the horizon, some new formulation in funding that's going to benefit Brockton? You know, Council, Councilor Dubois, I wish I could tell you I could. I know with the Mass Association for School Superintendents, we have uh, a lobbyist who is in there looking at funding for urban schools, you know, for suburban schools. Um, but, but I can't tell you if, if there's an appetite for looking at the funding, because obviously for a city like Brockton, we need many more dollars. We do good work here. Make no mistake about it. You have teachers that want to come here. You have highly qualified staff members. People want to come to Brockton. They like working with our Brockton children. They like having additional opportunities to coach, to do academic support, to work with the neediest kids in a summer school program, an after school program. So we, nobody does it better than we do. We just need to have the proper funding to be able to do it. And I'm willing to <laughs> my fellow councillors and the mayor to trying to find a solution to that. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to say was about uh, achievement. So I have spent a lot of time with this budget uh, because of the, I mean, typically I spend a lot of time with the school department budget, but more so now because I'm getting a lot of emails from parents, people I represent, teachers, talking about the cuts and how it's going to be devastating to their children. And even though the school board is autonomous, in a lot of ways and do a very good job with what they have. Um, normally I wouldn't have to pay too, as much attention. I still pay attention, but not as much as I have this past year. And so I went on um, the school rankings and I looked at the elementary schools in Brockton and there were so many of them in the 800 mark for achievement. And we want them in the 100 mark for achievement. Are you seeing, um, I, do you think, how, why, why are our school, our elementary schools 
in that um, lower achievement uh, echelon. Okay, uh, you're talking about the MCAS scores? I'm not, I'm not sure what you were looking you know, at I, for achievement. You know, I ha I maybe I can follow up with you because I, I you know, have I said to Can we, can we can stay on point? And we'll oh, talk about thought, that offline. I just thought since the, the achievement numbers were back here that it would be okay to talk about. No, but you know, it's a tough question to ask when offline. you're not sure if it's about MCAS or not. It no, depends what totally it is. No, you're totally right. That's fine. I, I think it was a general I will be happy to come back and speak to you about accountability yeah. status, things that we're doing. I think that would be good because um, I was concerned about some of that yes. being, in, I wish that they were higher. And we are concerned. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Yaniri. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Madam Superintendent. Good evening, Councilor. And thank you for coming here this evening, and thank yep. you for your uh, presentation. I do have to say, probably in all the years I served at the school committee level and even as a member of the Brockton City Council, this is probably one of the, I mean, most difficult school department budgets I've seen before me in, in some good, good many years. And it's a mis misfortune that, that we have to deal with this at this particular point in time. Um, and uh, I know we're here to discuss the, the budgets that, you know, that is particularly before me, but in the same token, I agree a little bit uh, somewhat with even my counsel from Ward 1, um, even my great concern of, um, you know, not using the levy to its fullest, not that I am a taxpayer as well as a lot of other people sitting in this room. I don't want to see an increase in tax, but I also know that when you're not using something to the levy, then you're obviously got to come up with costs somewhere else and this is the misfortune is what we got before us this evening because now it goes back to this department that we have to take away from which hurts the children of the city of Brockton. So, I mean, uh, not a parent, great uncle. I have many nieces and nephews all went through this public schools and I was a great product of it as well, graduating some 42 years ago. So I didn't do too bad. Uh, I think I did pretty well for myself to be truthful with you. So all a part of the Brockton public schools. But in any case- I agree, Councillor Ioneri. Thank you. In any case, when I do look at your budget, and I have to be turned to page 21, um, it just concerns me a little bit because I just want to make sure it's clear in my head that when I'm looking at a few of these items here, and it, it comes under the contract services, but it just caught my eye when I was looking through that obviously some of the things I see here, TBD to be determined, I would obviously say is this is just a little bit of some of the things that you are anticipating to be able to do that you're not able to at this point in time. Um, some of the programs I We've, see, coaching for change, yeah. fingerprinting. Well, some might. of the things are mandates. Okay. Other things we have cut very deep uh, into programs in the first round of cuts. Okay. Um, would you like me to share with you some of the, the first rounds of cuts or under contract services? Um, if you could, because I'm just interested to know just what, what some of them were. Okay, we, we cut uh, Bridgewater State City Labs. Uh, we actually moved that to grant funding. Uh, a number of programs under technology, Hub, LCN, um, School Warehouse, Hawkeye Fence, which was the lease for our new uh, warehouse. We've put that off right now. Uh, okay. IB Testing, um, Fuller Museum, which offered, I believe, $5,000 for our children to, to go to Fuller Museum. Um, in telecom, uh, Mass Inside, uh, Apangia, which is a learning math, we cut $50,000 to my turn, <laughs> which has been a program that's been in Brockton for many years okay. and supports many of our first time college goers. We cut um, $50,000 to Independence Academy, which although we do support them, the per pupil expenditure, that had been an addition and again, you know, something that we could no longer afford. Okay. So, Councillor Ioneri, we went through, as I told you, yep. this whole budget book, and I don't want to talk about low-lying fruit, but if it was something that didn't impact instruction or the classroom, as when I'm talking to you about sports and about intramurals and about clubs for our students and going back to the drawing board to look at the fine arts and our music department and our drama department, those are very serious cuts, and I agree with you. I've been here 37 years. I've had pink, six pink slips myself. Right. I've been through difficult times. Uh, this, to me, cuts deep in the core of everything that we believe in in Brockton for our children. And I'm finding it very difficult. I, I, as your superintendent, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I have to balance the budget with you. And certainly, I will promise you that we will do our very best to deliver the services to the children and the families. But certainly, it's not without great, great concern. 
Well, as a councilor, um, Madam Superintendent, there, there'd be no way I'd be doing anything different to this budget, nor, nor would I have a vote to even reduce it any further because I think it's, it's, it's met a reduction that shouldn't even have been met with, to be truthful with you. So, I mean, I, I definitely support whatever we have to do to try to, you know, get the whole system back online. And, and you, you know that I would. <laughs> My, um, one... Just one question, I do want to go back because you, you mentioned it and, and it was just because a couple other uh, people throughout the system mentioned to me about the, um, the warehouse. It, it was intended that you were going to be moving the warehouse from the old Cochrane, Cochrane building, building to another location. Correct. Was determined, that location was determined, am I correct? That is correct. It was on Foster Street, the old... It is the old, is it Nissen? 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 Right, but at this point in time, that's in a holding pattern, is that... It, Correct it is on somewhat. hold for a short amount of time because I believe we do have to vacate the Cochrane building. Right. Which, I mean, that building, we should have vacated it a long time ago, in my own personal opinion, but um, in any case, I can, I can understand uh, the situation here. But um, those are the, uh, I mean, that's the only concern I have. And, and of course, the concern I have is naturally it impacts all the schools within the city of Brockton um, for what we're doing here, but it also impacts the schools you've mentioned, a couple of them that are in my ward, Huntington. Well, how far we've come in the last several years, and some people wanted to close it a few years ago and move it to the Gilmore, and look what we did. I mean, well, just, and, it's and amazing I, what, what Mrs. Saber Mrs. Saber did in her staff there to that school. And it's, I will tell you, they are presenting uh, down in Orlando, Florida, because they have been chosen as a model school, that's a great. turnaround school, that's and again, great. something that you can be very proud of. And again, I don't want to date myself because my, my colleagues get upset with me when I do that. But in any case, the modular classrooms at the Kennedy School, I was there when they came in. And they were only supposed to be there for a short period of time. And you're right. We're on to what, 20 years, 18 years now? 20 years. And I hope you'll take the bus tour with me. We'll look at a number uh, of offices. Uh, it seems that, that Matt George used to like to take bus tours. And I know that's where you got it from. <laughs> I, I met and with I'll Matt, go with you, definitely. I met with Matt George on Thursday. We spent about two hours. Um, it is amazing what Mr. George got us through for many years in this city. Um, and again, he is just a, a great assistance to me, and I will continue to meet with him on a regular basis. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. President. Hey, Council, I know you bought the popsicles for the student at the Huntington, I, Huntington I Parade. Did, I did so we do the bus tour. You're going to buy popsicles for everybody, right? Whatever you want, Councilor. All right. Councilor Isaac, please. Good evening, Superintendent Smith. Thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for everybody. I see so many familiar faces out here. Um, I have two children in the Brockton Public Schools, in elementary and middle school, so I'm very concerned. Um, you know, we can go into detail with the budget. I know you, the school committee and yourself have done a great job doing the best you can with it. So I hope we come to a great decision. But I have a quick question for you. Have you hired a new um, grant writer or somebody? Or Because that's so important that we get these funds that we're missing. What we did um, in looking at our organizational chart, and this was through entry planning, we brought on a new director of grants and development because it isn't just grants, it is also looking at development, looking at alumni, looking at businesses to support our schools. So what we did was we hired Laurie Silva, who was your former 21st century grant writer. And those of you, and I will tell you that's a position that has remained unfilled. So when I say we hired Laurie, we also left her job vacant. And Laurie is heading up a team. So we have gone throughout the district and grabbed any grant writer that is out there. Heather Arrighi, Shauna Gray, Karen Watts, who's been in our department, Corin Cappiello. Because as I said, I love when I talk to Laurie. She recently came to me and said, there was talk about two federal grants were out. We were going after one. And she said, absolutely not. We're going after both of those grants. She's got a number of grants on the table with her team. Not that that's always the answer. But for right now, when we're talking about a Band-Aid, every little bit helps. So she is out there as we speak, uh, working with the team to look for funding. As I said, there's no dollar left on the table. Thank you. Any further questions, Councilor? Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Monahan. Oh, Bonzi, you decided not to do it. I'm um, okay. Okay. Good evening. Uh, just one quick question: If you had gotten, um, if we had gotten the money for all the students we picked up over the last few years, would that have been enough to have 
Ha had your budget been uh, complete? I can't, I can't tell you it's enough, Councilor Moynihan, because, you know, as the mayor has told you, even with, if you look at the past two years, yeah. $11 million on the backs of 450 children two years ago, we were able to survive at that point because we still had 1.8 in race to the top funding. That had carried us for a number of years. Um, we, we didn't incur, as we did just now, uh, large amounts because of a very tough winter like everybody did with increased utility costs. You know, we're facing, again, over a million dollars in step raises. But what did hurt us was, again, when you talk about 439, very similar to the 450, and 8.5 million came this year to the district. And that's why I said that Aldo Petronio and I met every Friday. We looked at the forecasts of the money as it came down. We realized somewhere around March into April that that inflation factor was going to hurt us. And indeed, it hurt us but by $2.5 million. So had we had that $2.5 million, it wouldn't have solved all our problems. It certainly would have gone a long way to reduce the numbers of layoffs or even any layoffs. We might have had to make some programmatic cuts. Right. And, but it has to do with the way the formula is, right? Yes. So and up to um, Council Cruz, when he brings you in as a resolve, I think we ought to bring the state delegation and, and federal just to come in and speak about these different formulas, how it is screwing the city, basically. Right, right. And nobody knows it better than Jay Condon when you sit and talk about the foundation formula. You know, Jay will talk to you about every aspect of how they count students, how they count their needs, how those dollars add up, and how it still isn't enough to sufficiently fund uh, our district. Right. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Monahan. Councilor Rodriguez, followed by, followed by Councilor Stewart. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Madam Superintendent. Uh, I'm going to bring up the. Um, what the hell's wrong with this thing today? I'm going to bring up the um, the question about the uh, white elephant in the room, which is 43 Crescent Street. Uh, I actually saw a sign in the audience that said uh, something cut from the top. I also saw that. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a lot of people in this community have been asking that question. It hasn't been brought up. And again, let me profess by saying I'm a product of the Brockton Public School System. Uh, again, Sunday, I handed a diploma to my daughter who just graduated from Brockton High. And there's not a single person that stands here that does not sing the praises of our, of our public school system. You know, that's not what's in question here. And not a single one of us want to lay off a single person that works in the system. But the question has to be asked. First, and there's a couple questions that I have. First, what exactly did you cut from the, the white elephant sitting across the right? <laughs> I didn't know it was referred to as the white elephant. Well, it's in the room. That's why nobody's talking about it. Okay, but well, I I'm very happy to speak to that. One of the things that I told you in coming in as a superintendent, I did try to restore some of the cuts that were made back in 2010. And when you talk about a district, you have 17,000 students in this district. You are the fourth largest school district. As I just said to you, we're the only one without an early childhood coordinator. I brought on two new executive directors, one new executive director. The other was by virtue of somebody moving up and taking over the position of Deputy Superintendent John Jerome. The two first immediate cuts that I took we're putting those two executive directors back at West Middle School and Dr. Clifford Murray and June Saber back at the Huntington School. So those were two deep cuts for us with the district, as Councillor Dubois points out, looking at MCAS scores, looking at our accountability status, my sharing with you the idea of not just two turnaround schools, but looking at four turnaround schools. I felt that was a deep cut. We also cut five administrators at Central. I cut at, well, I can't say just at Central, but we cut a position at the high school uh, that was an administrative position. We cut a position out of special education. I cut a position out of the bilingual department. I cut a position out of the community school's 21st century program. And we cut a position that oversees, again, out of Central, our library services, K-12. to So that was the effort that I made. Rather than weaken the district, I, I took a stance that those cuts ran deep at Central. I'm, I'm not sure what else that you, you wanted me to look at. No, the reason why I'm saying that is because there's some folks even within your system, mm -hmm. teachers, um, paraprofessionals, yep. administrators, 
that actually feel that our system is top heavy, that there's, there's a lot more administrators that we should have. Because I, what they're saying is that perhaps if we lost some of the administration that we have, we can put teachers in the classroom. Right, and, and that's true. And, and Councilor Rodriguez, one of the things that I'll share back with you, when we talk about 40% students, uh, an increase in our bilingual students, probably close to a quarter of the youngsters, and 40% of them uh, do not speak English as a first language in their home. I have Jose Pinheiro in my office talking to me about compliance, talking to me about how difficult it is for him, for Kelly Silva, for the administrators there to do all the accountability that's required, all the compliance reporting, the support for the teachers in the district. I have Laurie Mason, Director of Special Ed, in my office talking about that growing population, looking to bring people, meaning students, back in the district to make sure our resources stay here. Um, you know, continually looking at, I'm not looking to add positions, but I'm looking to make sure that we are not putting ourselves in a position where we are not in compliance, where we have oversight from the DESE. We just had a district review done this past November. I was notified in October that, that our time was up. And they come in and they spend four days in the district looking at everything from finances, administration. And basically some of the things that they told us were, I needed to bring back some positions and I'll be very happy to share that with you. There was reporting in there about some of the challenges we face as a district. I have them coming in my office, meaning the state, tomorrow at one o'clock to talk about next steps. Now while they can't mandate change, they're going to be looking very seriously at how we operate as a school district, and again, the fourth largest school district, with the largest growing population in the state. Because there's, there's actually folks in this room uh, that have said to me that knowing that this was going to be a real tough budget season, that the system went out in higher positions, brought in individuals, for certain positions that we could have kind of held off, at least until we settle the budget and figure out exactly where we are, because we knew that this, I mean, you from the presentation that you made at the high school, mm -hmm. we, lost, um, uh, we lost $10 million in grants over the last couple of years. Correct. Uh, that's $10 million that we lost, and we, know, we knew that it was gonna be a tough budget season even before this council got sworn in or the school committee got mm -hmm. sworn in. But then there's some folks that are saying that somehow that it was ignored. You know, we went out and hired the positions that we, I, that we wanted sure, to hire. I'm not sure, Councilor Rodriguez, as superintendent, as I said, I brought in a grant director and I didn't replace that person's position. I brought in two executive directors for reasons I shared with you. They were immediately cut and put back into their, their schools. So I would have to sit with you and very honestly look position by position, and I have no problem being transparent, whether it's with the city council, my school committee, or the employees that I work for, and, and share with you, you know, if there was a hire, why there was a hire. Right, because I, I think when, once the, we all start tightening the belt in the sense, because yes. I honestly don't believe that it's almost like you're gonna pick and choose which child shouldn't eat, mm -hmm. you know, because, okay, even though we, we go to the, uh, the allowed tax levy in the community, mm -hmm. if you need $6 million, we can only give you two point something something, somebody's going to go hungry. And one of the things that I did immediately was put a hiring freeze in. Once this budget was delivered and we saw the writing on the wall, there is a hiring freeze, and that's why I stated to you that at this point I am looking at each and every item and what it does for a new superintendent. You know, certainly there are years that go by that I don't think people or superintendents or leadership teams go in depth the way that we have had to go in depth in this budget. And another question that I had, you, um, you did say that you pink slipped uh, 73 non-teachers as Correct. well? Correct, non-certified personnel. What did you, do you know what those numbers are? What, what does that translate into dollars and cents as far as what you're saving from the 73? That you uh, yes, let me just get to that sheet. And that would have been administrative assistants, custodians, paraprofessionals. Right, but in dollars, I mean, what did you actually save by laying off uh, 73 folks? It was about 3.1 million. 3.1 million? Okay. Yes, 3.181 uh, million. 
But, but I guess, and Council, Sullivan, Council President Sullivan said it very clearly, we're not, you know, this body here does not have the authority to basically do anything other than either we, we approve it or we reject it. So, but we want to also to make sure that we're representing our constituencies. Uh, we're not part of the school uh, committee, but overall, we probably received as many phone calls as the folks in the school committee in terms of um, actually almost saying that thinking that we're the ones who actually are cutting the budget and, and not providing you with the, the appropriate funds to fund the schools. And we wanted to make, make sure that uh, they understand that we're asking the right questions. We're, we're putting pressure in places where the right cuts are made, but at the same time not, not hurting the classroom. You know, because I, I honestly believe that, I mean, as a, as a product of the system, it's important for us to do that. Uh, you mentioned the bilingual program. I'm a product of the bilingual system, you know, and, and a proud graduate of the, Bro the, the Brockton Public School bilingual program. I wish it was then what it is now, to be honest with you, because I think I would have maybe been sitting someplace else, not sitting on the council seat. But. And, Councilor, that was one of my priorities coming in, and as you heard me talk about whether it was advocacy centers, whether it was getting more parents involved, whether it was English uh, language classes for parents to make sure that they could continue to support their children. You know I went out there and spoke with a large number of parents from the Cape Verdean community, the Haitian community, and I very clearly heard what they wanted maintained in the Brockton Public Schools, the things that they were concerned about. They shared a lot of concerns with me. They shared concerns with me about communication. I need to find a new way. I brought in recently, I had three adjustment counselors show up on my doorstep back in the fall, totally different times, talking to me about the large Ecuadorian pop population coming in, our Haitian population, and the ways that I need to develop a cultural proficiency, not just in our city, but with our staff, to make sure that they understand the needs of this large and growing population. No, we, we do appreciate, I mean, I appreciate every single thing that every single one of the uh, folks in the, in the public school system do, and, and the teachers and the, the administrators within those schools, they do a wonderful job. Again, that's not what we're here for. We're here to tell you that, you know, we don't have much to do with this. We're advocates with you. You know, if we can go out and advocate to help you, the, you know, to help you out, we'll help Thank you out. You. But the issue is that we need to be a little smarter how we do things across the street so that, you know, we don't have signs like the sign that's back there that says cut from the top. I read we it. Want, we want to make sure that cuts are made from the top and that everybody feels the pinch. Uh, I mean, we, we're, we're, you're talking about a body that all, all together, I think our, our budget is what, $120,000, you know, all of us together, you know, so we know what it's like to be on the other side of things. But again, I just wanted to thank you and the, and the teachers that are in the room here for all the work that you do and keep up the good work. Thank Mr. you. Thank Mr. you, President, Council, thank you Council Stewart, and then follow-ups by Cruz and Dubois. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Smith. Um, so I started my volunteerism in the city with you on you the Community Schools Advisory Board, and we go uh, way back, and I've had the pleasure of serving on that board as a city councilor for two terms. And as you know, my, my son went through Brockton Public Schools, uh, elementary, middle, actually was junior high at the time, and also high school. Um, I actually have just three questions, and um, I wasn't quite understanding your comment around Schedule 19. Uh, Schedule 19, again, has been something that I have tried to educate myself with, with the help of, of Jay Condon. So when money comes in uh, under Chapter 70 funding, for instance, I talked about the $8.5 million. Out of that, the school department saw, I believe, $3.7 million, and the city saw $4.8 million of that. Because we are the largest group of, of employers that you hire. We have over 2,400 employees. We have a number of retirees. And with that comes cost. And some of it is dollar for dollar. I'm told the health care cost, which we know is astronomical, and other things legally are allowed, and, and Mr. Condon helped me out here, but we are allowed to look at a ratio of what the school department um, uses on the city side. And by, by looking at that amount un, under schedule, schedule 19, the city is able to retain some of the Chapter 70 money for the city side to pay our expenses. So one of the things that I will continue to do going forward is to meet with Mr. Condon on a regular basis and to make sure, again, that if there is money that is due on the Schedule 19 side, then, then so be it. 
but if there's money that is due back to the, to the school side under Chapter 70, I want to make sure that every dollar is over there for, and again, I call it on the backs of these students. Because when you look at that additional 8.5 million, that was based on additional students that came into the system. So uh, can I ask Mr. Condon to come, so, so that I'm understanding. So we're talking about 8.5 million and the assumption from the school department is that more of that, those dollars should be allocated to the school side? Is that what I'm yes. hearing? Yes. Basically, when the state passed the Education Reform Act, it said it established a foundation budget. That's the budget we've been uh, castigating all night as having some deficiencies in terms of providing adequate funding. But it also said once you've established this foundation budget, the um, components of how it gets funded are split into two pieces. One is a city contribution that's calculated by the state, and the second is the Chapter 70 funding, which is what's the foundation budget minus the city contribution. Having established all that, you realize now for this year, for the city's district, we have a foundation budget of about 200 million, of which the responsibility for city local funds is about 38, just under 40 million. Then there's an entirely separate ca calculation which takes place. And this is also under the Education Reform Act. The act says some of that foundation budget, 200 million, 38 from the city, 100 and something million from the school, uh, from the state, some of that is going to be spent not in the school appropriation, but it recognizes that some costs are carried in the city's budget because that's where they're located. They aren't divvied up among all of the different departments. The most important of these are health insurance costs, other benefits costs such as retiree costs for people who are not school teachers, that, that's paid for by the state, but the other employees in the system are paid by the Brock and Retirement System. Costs like the Medicare tax cost, because anybody hired since 1986 is uh, subject to the Medicare tax and the city pays its share. All of those costs are paid out of the city budget, not out of the school department budget. There are some other costs that can come, come up on Schedule 19. Any student who goes to a charter school or is attending school under the school choice, choice program, those costs are carried in the city budget. You don't see them as an appropriation because they come right off the chap of chap uh, top of Chapter 70, but that doesn't go to the school department and it gets accounted for on Schedule 19 because those costs aren't available for spending in the Brockton schools or already, already leaving the district for, for the purpose of paying the charter or the school choice cost. There are costs for maintenance, um, not an awful lot, a few hundred thousand dollars, but some of Jimmy Kasiri's department and some of the DPW department costs and even some of the parks department costs for maintaining school grounds, plowing the parking lots, uh, plowing um, roads getting to the schools, and maintaining the buildings with the public property tradesmen. Those costs are accounted for on Schedule 19. And finally, there's this category called administration cost. On that, there is uh, a, an allocation of costs that are uh, in the city's budget for the mayor's office, for my office, for the accounting office, for the treasurer's office, because all of these functions benefit the school as well as the city side of the budget. You know, we collect the revenues that go out to pay for the, the local contribution. We provide accounting for the school system. We provide payroll services. We manage the money. I provide services as a CFO for both sides. All of those costs can be allocated, including some of the law department, not much, but a little bit. At the end of the day, you have two ways you can allocate those costs. One is to identify them and see what percentage of the budget that the city, uh, you know, the schools represent of the total city budget and apply that percent to those costs. Or you can use a statewide average per student for those costs. We do the former. We do it on a percentage of budget basis. And by doing that, we charge a million dollars less than if we were doing it on the per pupil, pupil cost. So Schedule 19 is an attempt to recognize that not all of those foundation budget costs are actually in school budget. Some are on the city side. And the report that develops those costs is developed jointly by Aldo staff and mine. It's about that thick. If any of you really want to read it, it's line by line again. And most of the cost is in the health insurance line item, which is specific by a person and uh, what plan are they enrolled in. So I picked up, so uh, Madam Superintendent, so I'm just trying to understand that because I, I, when, when I heard Schedule 19 in your presentation, and Mr. Condon, if you can stay up because I, I may have some other questions around this. Um, I sense that there was some discrepancy between what the city side believes, how the city believes those costs should be allocated, and what the school department believes. So clarify me what's going on here. No, I, as a new superintendent, I just again want to make sure that I understand Schedule 19, 
that I make sure that if it's money that needs to be allocated to the city, and, and I work with Mr. Condon, but I also want to make sure that dollars that belong on the school side stay on the school side. And, and, and so are you, hold on one second, I, I think Mr. So, Mr. I Condon, think the Mr. Condon, I think the, hold on one second, I'm just, okay. I just have a question. So are, are you suggesting that you are, is it your belief that some of those dollars that you believe should sit on the school side are coming to the city side? Is that? Well, it isn't my belief. I'm, I'm just learning the formula, the Schedule 19 formula. And in talking with the DESE, with the district review, one of the mandates they said to me as superintendent was to make sure that the money that they give, and they give 80% of the funding, you know, comes from the state. So to make sure that those dollars that need to remain with the students come to the students. So okay. as I said, I'm working very closely with Mr. Condon to make sure I understand it. And as superintendent, when I'm questioned by the DESE, I can give them an informed answer as to how those funds are spent. And as Mr. Condon said, the first time I got a look at it was sometime in February. And it is a, a you know, voluminous document that is difficult to understand, and, and I continue to, to work with the city to make sure that I'm able to, I mean, to certify you, that the monies are spent right, correctly. But you certainly mentioned it for a purpose. I mean, it's a public forum, and we're in a budget hearing, and I'm trying to understand why yes. that particular item was mentioned. So, so there are two scenarios. There's, the, yeah. there's scenario one and scenario two. The city elects to do the scenario one based on percentages of the budget. Are you suggesting that we should do it based on student ratios, on the number of students? It, oh. I was, I was asking as the superintendent, actually. I believe some of it is based on ratios. Some of it is based dollar for dollar, whether it's health care insurance or things that you can quantify a certain amount. And then others, such as the law office or the DPW, I guess, is based on. And as I said, we are the largest employee group you know, to the city. We understand that. So I believe that's done on a ratio. No, DPW is actual dollar. OK. And then what, what is that amount? What's the difference, then, in what's presently being allocated and what could possibly be allocated if this were done differently, I guess, with scenario two. The, the alternative would be to allocate more to the city side because the ratio approach is beneficial to the school system as opposed to the student per pupil statewide average. I By see. doing it that way, we're saving them about a million dollars. That ends up going over to their side. We could, if you chose, say, let's change that approach. Let's do it the other way. It's allowable. You can't keep shifting back and forth. You can only make one of these, but if you did it, then a million dollars less could be counted on Schedule 19, and you could have said we'll give you not 160 million, but 159 million. And then who makes that decision? We made it at the very beginning uh, when every, every form was adopted, and we've been using the same technique because we got it approved by the Department of Education at the time as to how we were doing it. I guess I'm that. saying, who's we? So is it coming out of who makes that decision? It's a joint between decision between the schools and the city. The document uh, is part of the school system's end of the year report, mm -hmm. and the Schedule 19 por portion is signed off by me, the mayor, and the superintendent. Okay, so the three of you decide what formula, what process we use. No, we, we use the same process year in and year out. You can't be varying it. What we say is these are the costs that are identified under these formulas. Okay, thank you. Um, I have some, uh, two more questions. Um, this is for the superintendent, so I think that answers my question. I may have some follow-up outside of this forum on, on that Schedule 19, because I just wasn't aware of it, so I think I want to get better informed about what it is. Yeah. Um, the, whole, the whole issue around, and this is very discreet, but I'm just curious, I couldn't quite find it in the budget. So the issue around the crossing guards and the the it's under non-net school spending. Okay. And, and what is the total cost of, this is the issue of the, if I remember correctly, the pretty exorbitant pay that crossing guards are receiving based on the old contract. I'm just, what is that total budget? I know it's an insignificant amount, but I'm curious. About 800000 I'm sorry, I'm just checking my figures here. Uh, in the crossing guards, that does come under the non-net, which is, city side funds, non-net school spending. Uh, it includes all of our transportation. It includes the crossing guards. It includes some of the community school uh, director's position, adult learning center position, anything that isn't necessarily directly related to teaching and K-12 to positions. But the 800000 is for the, the contracts with the crossing guards explicitly per year. So it's almost a yes. million dollars a year. And then um, that's a lot of money. And if, if those... Well, we're, we're presently looking, uh, because one of the things that didn't come up tonight was uh, the funding, uh, and I'm a little surprised, but the funding of our, our buses, which many families obviously depend on, you know, in the city. 
Uh, so the way that it was funded uh, originally, we were close to $1.2 million short. So the mayor came up with, I want to say it was on May 20th at one of our school committee meetings, an additional 500000 which again brought us to what you would call level services to, to what we actually used last year. But unfortunately, what happened this year was in the middle of the year, I believe we put on two additional buses because of the large numbers of students coming in. And this year, because of our growth, we needed to put on another three additional buses. So presently, as I stand here, we are $700,000 short in non-net school spending directly related uh, to the busing. And one of the things that we have started to look at is reducing the number of crossing guard positions throughout the city. I see. And that, and that number again per hour for the crossing guards was how much again? I think it varies from... An average of about forty dollars an hour, but it does vary. I think I kind of remember that in, in an article from last year or two years ago. So I, I just when I hear things like that and those issues aren't dealt with, and I know it's partly contractual. I think that's why the public is also resistant to a tax increase when crossing guards are getting forty dollars an hour, and you have people in this city who are probably averaging fifteen dollars an hour or less in income. I mean, those sort of things are, they're optical. You know, I know there's a lot of issues around it, but those, I just feel like some of those things need to be dealt with. Yeah. Um, and then my last question was actually related to Councillor um, Rodriguez's question, but I had it phrased slightly differently because I don't know what a central administration staff should look like for a district this size, and so it's hard for me to say if it's bloated or not. But so where, where do we stand you know, in terms of the total spending for central administration? Are we within what should be spent for a district this size? What, what kind of data is around that number? I think what, you know, one of the things that we struggle with, you can do anything with data. And when you look at some of the data with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, how people report things can be done differently from district to district. What people certify as an administrator versus a non-administrator. And we have talked about it openly, about trying to take a look at some of the like communities and when you talk about like communities, the closest to us is Worcester at number, uh, number three, I believe. Below us is Lowell, Lynn, similar communities. So I would have to take a deep look at similar communities. I did have an opportunity this year. Madam Superintendent, we just have to take a two minute recess. Cable needs to, we've run through the tape already. So we need to take a two minute recess. <laughs> Back in the session. Round Thank two. You, Superintendent. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, Councillor Stewart, what were we talking about? <laughs> yeah, who's buying the beer? I am a baby boomer, so it's late. Just issues around, um, it'd be nice to get some information on um, if the school district's central office represent the right percentage of staff and dollars. And I don't know if you have to answer that question now. It'd be nice if your team could email me something about that over the next day or so. You know, I, I can certainly put that together. As I said, I'd like to compare us to, to comparable districts dealing with the same kinds of issues that we're dealing with, and certainly that is out there in the state. We've also had talk at central office, and, and it was kind of on the other end when I came in. It was, are we resourced appropriately for 17,000 students, you know, quickly approaching, approaching probably 18,000 students in the next couple of years. So that's what we were looking at. Obviously, we're not a Boston. You know, we're close to a Worcester and, and more like a Lowell and a Lynn. And uh, I'll be happy to get that information to you if I can look at like positions. One of the things I will tell you. I think that information should go piggyback with Councilor Cruz's resolve. I think all that should encompass when, when the superintendent comes before well, Actually, I, I, if, if I could just interject, if it were possible, because it, um, I mean, there are questions around the budget and the validity of the budget. And for my thinking, it helps me frame my vote around this particular item. So if it were possible to have that before the vote is taken, that would be great. But I understand I'm asking, asking we'll for this. We'll start on it tomorrow, like, Councilor Stewart. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Cruz. Thank you. I, actually, I had three or four questions that are kind of specific to line items, and that's really not our job, the school committee, and you have done that. I do have one question I think Aldo may need to answer that is actually for a budget we'll be doing later this week. A couple of years ago, we approved a police lieutenant with the idea that the school department would pay us. Is that still in the budget? Yes, we, co we currently cover Lieutenant Mills' salary, and uh, we budgeted for his increase in salary. Where would I find that? What, what do you put that under? It's, um, there's a line item in there that says on the page it should say uh, sc well, school police. It's a thick and book. <laughs> 
All right, scan the school, please. On the page number 25. Okay, I'll and Right find below it. it, number 26 is police lieutenant. Okay. I just, that's really for future, uh, on page 25 it says police No, 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 on, on, the, on the budget page, the actual. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. That, I wanted that information. Now, currently, we also have a police captain up there, but you are not paying us any money. We are not talking that. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Petronio, just on that, on that context about Lieutenant Mills, the city right now is currently paying Captain Gomes, former Chief Gomes, to be at Brockton High School. And I should have asked this when the mayor was here. Is, is, his, is he still up there? And maybe Mr. Connor knows this, because it kind of goes along with having a captain up there and a lieutenant up there, and it's asinine. <laughs> he is um, uh, without coming on the asininity of it. He is paid in. <laughs> that the, was my humble opinion. <laughs> my humble opinion. He is paid in the police department budget. Out of the city side. Yeah. That's right. And Lieutenant Mills is paid in the school department. But they're both presently still up there. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Well. Thank you. Um, I think we had a follow up with uh, Council Dubois. Thank you so much. Um, Superintendent, I'm just wondering two quick questions, and I'm sorry I didn't see them in the budget book, so I'm just going to ask you. Is Brockton, do, are we funding uh, sex and relationship ed in, in this budget? Does Brockton offer I, that? I believe it's part of our, our wellness and health budget, yes. Okay, great. And um, the walking route. Are, how, are kids in Brookfield going to have to walk to the high school? Like, how, what is the cutoff for busing? Well, I, I, at this point, um, as I said, we are $700,000 short of what we need for busing. Uh, and, and what I will say to everybody, you know, as far as cutting back on busing, our largest amount of students bust because of where our high school is. We have a yeah. beautiful high school. It is located in the west corner of the city. So many of our students count on that busing. And that's how we base our number of buses as to how we use it for the middle school and the elementary because we have a three-tiered busing system. Yep. Um, presently, um, as I said, with the $700,000 short, we are trying to avoid increasing the walking zone. But if we do not get additional money, one of the things that I will tell you are those students, and I'm sure the Brookfield students will be bused to certainly the high school. A couple years ago, there was threats that that was going to be cut. So I just, wanna, I just wanted to ask the question. I don't see that happening. But what we might have to do is to start to issue you know, passes to the students for those students that legitimately, when we set the walking zones, would be able to ride the buses. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the superintendent relative to the school department? None? Madam Superintendent, thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you, you very much, City Council. <laughs> Council Stanisky. I would move uh, to request uh, numbers 10 and 11. Be taken next. Veterans Services, Veterans Council taken out of order. There's a motion. Second. Second. Motion made properly. Second. All in favor of that, raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Madam Clerk, we're going to take number 10 and number 11 out of order. And we'll just give maybe one minute to clear the, uh, the chamber. Veteran Services, David Farrell, Director. Mr. Farrell, good evening. Good evening. I want to first of all just thank you for the work you just did on the parade recently. Well, thank you. Thank you for all you do, David. Thank you for your service to the country. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Well, I couldn't do it without your support, and uh, I really appreciate it. Believe me. I did it. Well, my budget is uh, you know before you, and. Uh, I have no statement to make uh, other than that uh, I appreciate all the support you have given me in the years past and uh, uh, I think that uh, this year we're actually going to have a slight surplus and um, what I ask for should cover all of fiscal year uh, 2015. That would be veterans cash benefits. David, I have a question about, about how many new veterans, new meaning those that did Afghanistan or Iraq that y are you dealing with it in your office? Well, I would say we we, we see maybe three a week, and for the most part, it's uh, to refer to either, um, when I say Buffalo, New York, the headquarters of the GI Bill kind of certification process, 
veterans who are interested in uh, utilizing their uh, GI Bill uh, benefits. Uh, also, uh, individuals looking for the certificate of eligibility for the uh, VA home loan. Um, and uh, just a clearinghouse for people who need a copy of the DD-214 or pointed in the right direction for the welcome home bonus. You know, the, so much of what uh, is available to veterans nowadays is, a veter is available electronically. So it's really kind of, we give them a web portal, the address, and uh, they're usually pretty sophisticated at uh, finding their way through it. So. Okay. <coughs> Councilors, any questions for Mr. Farrell? <clears throat> Relative to agenda item number 10, which is veteran services, no questions? Okay, we're going to go on. Number 11, veterans councils. Any questions for Mr. Farrell? Seeing none, we're going to thank you for your, for your time, David. And also thank you for, uh, I know you're putting up a lot of signs around the city. Mr. Gad, who died at Normandy, you just did that the other day. Thank you. Mr. Tomaselli on Friday, Tomaselli Square, who died in World War II. Thank you for that as well. That means a lot. You're quite welcome. But uh, I have to remind you that uh, you brought that issue forward last year. And uh, one of my reservations was that we'd, we were missing uh, veterans who hadn't been honored. And in fact, I came across a couple who, uh, uh, their signs have been knocked down years ago, and I, I had no record of it. And fortunately, a couple of members of the community stepped forward and pointed out uh, uh, individuals who needed uh, their signs restored. So thank, thank you, you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Phil. Uh, agenda item, I'm sorry, Madam Clerk, law. Uh, Attorney Nezzarella, number four, please. <coughs> Attorney Nezzarella, good evening. Good evening, Councilor. Good evening, Council members. Do you have a statement or? Um, basically, um, Mr. Sullivan, the Council Sullivan, the the budget proposal uh, before the council is similar to the past years. It has been, it has been trimmed by a substantial amount, which is actually uh, obligating the uh, me current members of the law department to engage in additional work in additional areas, which I believe we, uh, we will address and we will aggressively handle. Uh, other than that, there are really no um, twists or turns to this. Mr. Nezer, I just had one question. Relative to the outside legal counsel, went down by about 260000 That's correct. Is that attributed to the power plant? Uh, Not necessarily. Lawsuit? The mayor did ask that there be a, a cut uh, on that in the general amount of 260000 because he inquired of me whether or not I thought we could handle uh, a significant amount of power, not only power plant related matters, but other matters which takes us into various jurisdictions, federal court, state court. Um, and that was because I felt we had the manpower. You think you can handle that in-house? Well, here's the, um, in an ideal situation with all things fitted the way they should, yes. But uh, I wasn't going to make the announcement this evening. But uh, we have three very talented assistant city solicitors, uh, two full-time. Uh, because one of the attorneys is what I consider a superstar in that office, uh, she has been engaging in very adversarial uh, matters with, with other parties, and her talent has been recognized by those parties she was an adversary with. They have made her an offer, and she has accepted the offer for a position in a private law firm, which will come about the end of June. Which attorney is that? That is uh, attorney Caitlin Leach. Uh, that is going to be a tremendous uh, gap in the office because it's a small office to start off with. So uh, I am going to engage in, you know, we, we are in, already engaged in looking for other people that will meet the residency requirement and also what I like to believe is a, a high standard uh, requirement to, to work within that office. So uh, in her absence, I'll be down to one and a half persons. I reported, just re recently reported this to the mayor, told him I would be very aggressive in seeking out someone of equal talent. But as you may be aware, Council, people don't always come into the office with the background. Uh, there's a large learning curve, and because we have a small office, it's difficult to surround them and give them that type of support. So it will be a challenge, but if the office is full to the capacity I had been here in the past seeking, I think we can do the job. Well, Attorney Leach is a great attorney. She's going to be missed in the Brockton, but we wish her well in her new endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney. Councilors, any questions for law? Council Bonds. Yes. Uh, hello, Attorney uh, Nasrallah. Uh, the, in the big binder here, there were two positions with the same person um, in that. Can those be consolidated and maybe a little bit of the funding cut on that? 
Hmm? Impossible. I'm sorry? Impossible. Okay, can you, I, I don't understand why. Well, which one are you pointing to? Number seven and number eight in the personal services. I, I don't want to share this person's name, but. Paralegal and secretary to claims committee. I don't know if I have that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a, a clerk stipend. Oh, it's a court stipend. The clerk, clerk. Yeah, it's, it's a st uh, for the no, traffic it's a, committee. It's not right. Not for the traffic. It's a separate, oh, it's a okay. Person, separate job, separate stipend. Yeah, I just and just some of the other information that we've seen with some of the cuts in positions. Some people have had to take on additional work without getting that. That's what I'm asking. Is there? She handles claims. Maybe I'm not asking it clearly. It's late. Yeah. So the answer is no? Well, if, if you're asking me if they can take on additional work without, I, I don't believe so. Or have some of that work just be absorbed in, in one, t I, I don't know, maybe I'm just seeing, it looks like one person's getting paid two things and I get one's a salary, one's a stipend, I understand that now. Right, and some of them is, <laughs> it's for work outside or beyond the office, traditional office hours. <coughs> okay. And those, again, for clerical secretarial, it's, it has nothing to do with the attorneys. Okay, well you mentioned before, when you came before uh, earlier in the year about the additional funding needed for the office for the attorneys that aren't required, or other, they're not eligible to do some additional work and getting paid and all these other kinds of things, you were very adamant about how that was um, kind of inappropriate and not done, but in this one it's budgeted for. Well, I'm talking, we're talking about the attorneys or the, the clerical staff, the attorneys, for whatever work they do, there is no overtime, there's no additional bonus or stipend paid for that. The clerical uh, is a different situation altogether. Okay, I guess I'm just looking at it as an mm -hmm. office. Right. Uh, point of information. Dynamic. Mr. President. Uh, uh, Council Stewart, point of information. I believe actually that role is uh, unionized, correct? Which is why that's it's correct. Right. So that's, that's correct. That's as, that's as, as opposed oh, to the, okay. the lawyers. It's a union position. In oh, okay. All right. Maybe that's why I, was, I wasn't asking correctly. All right. Thank you, Attorney. Thank right. you, Council Stewart. Thank you, Council. <laughs> Any other questions for the Chairman. attorney? Pastor Dubois. Um, so I just see the bottom look, bottom number here, um, and it seems like we're going up. Um, and w there's one vac uh, vacant and funded position, number three on our list for $52,982. Has that been filled yet? Have no, it hasn't. Have you hired anybody? No. Okay. Um, so, so how, who, who's in your office right now? Well, currently, Caitlin Leach until the end of the month, Karen Fisher, who is the full-time attorney, and Kate Federoff, that it, who is a part-time attorney. Okay. And yourself. Part That's correct. Okay. And then you're going to have a full-time... Full-time and a part-time. And then you'll have to hire to, to fill um, Caitlin Leach's position. Correct. All right. And the full-time position at 52,000, that's new this, com this, this year, right? We just, we just created it, what, like two months ago, right? That's correct. Why haven't you filled that yet if you were so desperate to get it? I've been advertising for it. It's very <laughs> difficult. interviewed yet for it? I have not interviewed. There's okay. Been, we have, we've had one interview. You've had one interview. All right. I, I, I think that I'm going to be moving to cut that, but um, maybe we can talk offline about it because it just seems like that could be yeah, money that we I, could be talking about. I, I think we money. should. Uh, and I, I will point out to the, the council what, what this uh, three lawyer staff is doing, aside from all the contract analysis and review of every department, including work involved with the school department as well, union negotiations, arbitration and grievances, uh, rendering legal counsel to all of the boards, defending all the appeals from zoning, uh, conservation and planning board, also involved in all the courts, federal, state, uh, housing court, administrative agencies, MCAD. Um, but you said enough. these exact same things like three months ago and you still haven't filled the position. I feel like well, some of this was calculated so you I haven't could get filled the, the number in the 2014 no budget number. Well, I so haven't filled... It wouldn't seem like it was an increase because from 2013 to 2015, we're looking at $122,000 in the personnel line item. 
again. So it's like, it's almost, it's almost disguising how much um, this new administration is spending versus what we were spending before. So I, I'm just concerned about that, and that's all I have to say. Thank uh, so you, you do Mr. have Chairman. the right to try to cut if you choose to. Thank Any you. other questions for anybody else relative to law? Any other council want to ask a question? Yes. Council Barnes is a follow-up. Yes, I'm, I'm fresh now. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, judgment item. The judgments that we've had to date have been more than this amount, correct? The amount that's budgeted for, for next year. Um, I'm looking for that amount. It's, it's budgeted for 150? Right, we're at approximately 200, 200 plus thousand dollars. Okay, so this is gonna be a problem later. I mean, anticipating you know, more um, legal uh, filings. And, and, and it's quite frankly, relatively, That's a relatively low amount in judgments compared to the amount of activity in the office in a city of this size uh, to have that small amount, which is related to the aggressive defense that uh, the, the law department has been rendering. Okay. I'd also like to just, I, I, I didn't have an opportunity to uh, respond or make a point. We are in dire need of that additional staff. The fact that no one has come forward and I can't find one doesn't say, well, we don't need the position anymore. Um, there's only, and I'm not certain that uh, others who are currently working at full steam capacity may not at some point in time sense that it's probably an easier life on the outside with additional money because counselor, after hearing some comments earlier, the part-time attorneys are making $5 less than crossing guards. So let's try to keep them let alone worrying about cutting the positions, uh, yeah. that would be at the dire expense of the whole city. It sounds like you might need some aggressive attorneys with a low, low ball um, estimate for judgments. You might need those crackerjack sharks in their office to... Well, there's it's a little more complexity to about those judgments than necessarily the, the lawyers uh, and the ability of the lawyers. Her job is okay. She's Thank you, sir. Expensive. Thank you, Counselor. Anybody else? Hi. Attorney Nazarello, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, the assessor, uh, here he is. Good evening, Mr. Assessor. Good evening, counselors. I just wanted to um, just make a brief statement for our listening audience and for some of our new counselors. Um, the department is the assessor's office, and our department mission is to determine the full fair market value of all the property in the city of Brockton for the purposes of taxation and to assess property taxes and administer vehicle excise taxes in a fair and efficient manner. Some of the other services that we provide are to evaluate the real and business personal property within the city. We determine the city tax rate uh, from these evaluations and we determine abatements, exemptions for eligible citizens under the provisions of Chapter 59, as well as um, excise abatements and exemptions. We uh, also complete transfers of ownership of real estate. We maintain records of excise tax. We correct any discrepancies on tax bills and we, if we have to, add betterments and liens to tax bills. Um, the budget this year, we've had um, a slight reduction um, as uh, requested basically from the mayor trying to see how we can um, trim the budget. So with that, I would entertain any questions that you may have. Is there any questions at all for Mr. Uh, Sullivan? Yes. Uh, just one thing, uh, Mr. Sullivan. The amount of money that... Um, is I guess well, assessed on the excise tax for like late payments, the warrant and the um, the other one, the late fees, like thirty dollars and things. Is that budgeted in here somewhere? No, for, no okay. that is through the collectors. Um, oh, okay. All Mr. Right. Brophy, he's coming up next. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure where that yep. came from. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, Council? No. Anybody for Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Sullivan, good evening and thank you. Thank you very much, Councilors. Thanks, for hanging around. Uh, Madam Clerk, number six and seven, please. Treasurer Collector, Martin Brophy, Treasurer. Good evening, Ms. Brophy. Good evening, Councilors. Thanks for your patience tonight. 
Do you have a statement on um, I just want to thank my staff. Uh, we obviously in the collector's office deal with over approximately 300,000 bills that go out each fiscal year. Uh, treasurer's office, we deal with over 200 payrolls each fiscal year and a weekly accounts payable that usually can average over 500 checks in each run. So it's for the staff, it's quite a bit of work. Thank you, Mr. Brophy. Any questions for Mr. Brophy? Yeah. Councilor Cruz. Quick question. So you handle the, you run the paychecks for the school department too? Correct. And Mr. Connor, is that some of the things that are in cha uh, yes. chapter 19 or whatever it is? Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Bob. Yes, I'm still learning who does what. <laughs> um, so same question is, are, are the, uh, the warrants and those extra fees for late excise, is that those are, budgeted in here? As no, those, aren't, those are attached to a bill when it becomes late. The statutory, the fees of the collector, when a bill goes late, a, a tax bill, I can, uh, the council adopted the fee to $30. So. Right, but it, uh, are those funds anticipated on the amount of excise bill, excise tax bills that No, they'd be under penalties and interest. In the interest, uh, the revenues. So the budgeted revenues, they, they would be classified under penalties and interest for revenue. They're not a budgeted item. Oh, okay, not, I didn't, it, okay, I didn't know if that was counted no, on. It's a fee that's attached to a bill. Right. Similar to like if somebody pays their credit card late, they get charged a $35 fee or whatever the bank wants to charge them. <clears throat> right. Okay. So if the bill becomes past due, a fee is attached. Right. Okay. I just didn't know if it was anticipated that folks were going to be late. It's, and then. As Mr. Connor is saying, it's in the forecaster under. Yeah, penalties and interest. Oh, that's in there? Yes. In the revenue budget. One million is, yes, is the interest that's, again, when a real estate bill goes past due, it's 14% interest on the amount due. Um, tax title is 16%. Um, excise is 12%. Uh, so there's interest on any bill, and then there are demand fees that can be placed on a bill. Okay, okay so in the forecaster, that's what you anticipate as revenue, correct? That's for what, people being that's late. That's what the CFO budgeted in. Okay, so if everybody pays on time, if everybody pays on time, then our investment time. income will be higher. Okay, excellent. Thank you, sir. Council <coughs> Dubois. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Brophy. Thanks for being Good here evening. tonight. So I'm just looking at one item, line item for legal, and in 2014 it was 75,000, and then the department requested 38,000 for 2015. Correct. What caught, and then the year before in 2013 it was only 27,000. What was the 75,000 bump? What is that from? That bump we actually had. Um, that's my outside legal counsel for land court cases when uh, properties in tax title and there's been no activity. We actually go into land court and start the foreclosure process. So that particular year we needed, uh, we had more cases to go into land court. Could you give me um, offline a list of what parcels of land went to land court through this 75,000 or what department would I ask for that from? I'd have to check with the outside council. I, I get an updated list, but I mean some, we start the process and they come forward and pay it and we don't go any forward. Okay, so do you think you could provide me with a list of um, what parcels of land you um, propose going to land court in? Would that, like, what would be the easiest I can, way for I'll you to I'll provide you the tax title list. From 2014? <clears throat> From all the active accounts. There's over 600 active accounts. 600 active tax right. title account, meaning it's at some stage of city possession of it, taking of it. Is that correct? We perfected the lien so that we will collect that money. And, and if we, in, since we've done that, it gives us the right to actually start a foreclosure process. And will the, any of the cases that are involved in the 75,000 be in, on that list, or are they be on that list? They'd have to be on that list. They'd have to be on that list. Um, and then is there any way I could like maybe surmise, oh, this might be the one or that might be the one? My philosophy has been um, the highest dollar amounts. 
Okay, so maybe you can send that to me, and if I have any other questions, I'll just follow up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chairman. Councilor. Any other questions? Uh, Councilor Stewart and then Rodriguez. Uh, Mr. Brophy, uh, two questions concerning, uh, I couldn't find a place. So the new online website, for example, that the mayor talked about where we're doing lots of transactions online, does that impact your budget moving forward in terms of cost savings? or? Uh, not really. I mean, I still need to have a person pull that in and process it. Um, those payments still need to pro be processed through Munis. You're basically importing a file rather than a person coming to the window. Right, so that's just more convenient for the customer and not a cost saver for Absolutely. And, and then secondly, so we, uh, so the payment cycles for employees, I'm assuming some folks are paid we weekly by weekly by we have, we have five different payrolls. Yeah, tell me more about that. I'm curious about the cost of having these different a, a city of weekly pay payroll, which a school weekly payroll, a school bi weekly payroll, uh, a city bi weekly payroll, and a community school payroll. Okay, and they're all bi weekly, or bi uh, monthly? No, there's two, two weekly, mm -mm. Two, okay. uh, a school weekly, and a city weekly. Okay. So, does um, streamlining that and putting those all in the same payment cycle, does, is, that, is there a cost benefit to doing that? Time-wise, I mean, the steps to actually complete that payroll on our end, um, not a lot. I mean, it's, you know, we, it's a pretty streamlined process to begin with. So uh, it would be a convenience to have two payrolls, but, uh, you know, it's been my 12 years that I've been here, it's been that way for, and it's, it's part of the contracts. It's contractual. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Brophy. Councilor. There's a couple um, items in here that kind of caught my attention. What is a stipend for? A stipend? Uh, actually, I'm the clerk to the real estate committee, so I actually get a stipend for that. Uh, if you look in but, the... But it's not listed under you? It just says on, in stipends? It's actually the title of clerk to the real estate committee is listed, and the stipend and for that is 3250 he still gets the stipend for it. No, no, I'm talking about the, the stipend line item that I see here. Correct, in the budget. $4,000? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's is, the one? There's thirty-two fifty for the clerk to the real estate, and there's seven hundred and fifty for the secretary to the trust fund committee. Okay. And also on the same note, what is, um, and I noticed that I'm uh, one of the newbies here, and I going through the budget, I've noticed that quite a few departments has the a line item for a clerical incentive. That's a union. Uh, but only, not payment. all departments actually have that. <laughs> only certain departments? I think it depends on the, it's the clerk's union. It's the bag. Clerk's union? So that's something like a, a, like a stipend that they get at the, uh, on top of their salaries? Correct. Okay. Now, no further questions, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any questions for Mr. Brophy further? Seeing none, Mr. Brophy, thank you. $30. Now we have to go to number seven, Treasurer's Debt Services. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Brophy. We're going to go to uh, Ms. Cruz, personnel agenda item number eight, please. Ms. Cruz, good evening. Good evening, counselors. Thank you for your patience as well. <laughs> thank you. Any, uh, any statement? Um, I won't reiterate a lot of what the mayor already said earlier. The, the health insurance budget went up about 4%. Um, for the new counselors, if you look at the personnel department budget, you will see that there are four staff members. Two of them are funded through the Health Insurance Trust Fund. They only do work related to health and dental insurance. They don't do any other work, and they then can be uh, charged to the trust fund. Um, and that, so the remainder of the two salaries are in the personnel department budget. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Any questions for Ms. Cruz? I just had one quick thing, uh, Maureen, and I ask it, I think, every year. Mm -hmm. So. My question is, and I, and I ask it every year for a reason, why, if, if you're a retiree and you pass away, why can't your surviving spouse that's going to maintain the health insurance, instead of monthly sending a check to Brockton, why can't they do, the city do an automatic withdrawal? We are working on that. You are? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I think, I think it in would, the past well, not, we did it, not, we did it for not Social Security reimbursement, I'm sorry. right? I'm sorry? We did it in the past for Social Security reimbursements. Uh, no, we cut them a check. 
we do direct deposit. Withdrawal out of your bank, uh, we're mostly looking at uh, an actual bill. Right now they don't get a bill. Okay. We're looking at a bill, uh, a monthly okay. bill to those people. So when I ask They can question. actually, they can do that through their bank right now. Most banks will do that. Okay. They can have a check cut to us. But it looks like, so if I ask this next year, we might have, uh, I'll possibly. Cross, I'll cross my fingers. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Cruz. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Have a good evening. We're going to go on to uh, Ms. Wolf Library, which is agenda item number 12. Right Director, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Do you have a statement? Uh, in the interest of time, I guess I really don't. Uh, just, okay. Just to say thank you to my staff for <laughs> <Okay. laughs> doing such a great job. <laughs> Does anybody on the council have a question for the library director? I do. I'm sorry? I do. Council Dubois has a question. Thank you so much. Um, so very welcome. I appreciate it. <laughs> so your budget is up. It's down from 2014, and it's down from what you requested. So what kind of cuts are you making, or what did you want to do with that extra $400,000 you had asked for? Uh, 355000 of it was in capital monies that um, was not uh, recommended by the mayor's budget. Great. And what, okay. what were some of those projects? An RFID system for tagging our materials um, t for anti-theft was one of them. That was the major one. Also for um, flooring replacement on a regular basis. We have a very well used um, facility as you know and the floors continue to be used over and over again so the building is getting pretty old, almost 12 years old now. Are we looking at any cuts in uh, hours or services? Um, this budget does not meet all the minimum requirements for state aid. The budget that I submitted to the mayor's office just barely met it with $70 to spare. But with the budget reduction that you see before you uh, presented from the mayor's office, um, will not uh, be certified for state aid at that level. How much are we going to lose? Um, we'll lose, lose about $100,000, between $100,000 and $150,000 in state aid if we, lose, if we lose our state aid. And that's with a, the $33,000 reduction. Sure. Uh, that, that was a mistake in my office, Counselor. There was a position that was double budgeted for, to reserve a position for a person who was on union leave in case the person came back. A uh, person came back, the position was cut from the budget, and the, uh, we didn't look carefully enough at what the requirement was for the incentive grant. So we'll need to find the $30,000 at some point this summer to re reappropriate it and get a robo bomb. Am, am I, I'm, I might be missing something, but I thought Ms. Wolf was said that it was more, it was, um, 355000 or is it no, just no, no. 30000 you're saying? No, the amount that's required, I think, is about 30000 to get over the hump. The amount that's at risk is $130,000. That's the incentive grant. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Any thank other you, questions for the library director? Seeing none, thank you, Ms. Wolf. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Uh, Councilor Neary. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'd like to move that we take the uh, auditors um, at this point in time and take it from Thursday's uh, agenda and move it up. I think that's appropriate. <laughs> second. Is there a second. Thank you. We're going to take, uh, if you look, guys, at uh, guys and gals, Wednesday, agenda item 15, 16, 17, 18, auditor, auditor mailroom, auditor telephone, and then retirement non-contributory. Good evening. Hi. you have a statement? Um, we are pretty much level funded. Um, our department has a lot of fixed costs. There's not a lot of places to cut. Um, I'll take any questions. Any questions relative to the auditor? I know. Tasa Rodriguez. It's so sad. Uh, good evening, Madam Murray. How are you? I, I just want to know what's going on with the uh, with our auditor. Um, she's out on a medical leave right now. For for quite some uh, quite she's some very time. Sick. I can't talk. Well, about we can't talk about medical. Uh, just, uh, yep. just wondering. I mean, because yep. I haven't seen her in, in in quite some time. I didn't know what uh, what was going on with her, and that's that's why I was asking the question. Thank you. Any other questions on the budget? Seeing now we're going to move on. We're going to go to number 16, auditor's mailroom. Any questions for the auditor? This is uh, easy. I have a question. Oh, we do. Okay. If you don't mind. Counselor. Um, have you thought, like, what is the postage? What, do you do bulk mail? What, what, are you, what are you doing? What are you paying for the postage? Right now it's at $240,000. How is this mailed? Is it mailed full full? We rate? have a, an actual mail machine downstairs that we lease. And we do the mail for the whole city. 
So you do the mail for the whole city um, daily or? Daily, every day. So is there a, a mail person or? My office handles it. We go downstairs, um, we have two girls in it. Well, actually we all know how to run the machine, but mostly it's two girls that take turns to go down and do it. So two staff basis. members, two ladies go down and they take care of that. They run the, the mail through the machine and then we have a courier system that picks it up and delivers it to the um, post office for us. Could you give me like an estimate of like how, what's the biggest amount of mail you might mail in a day? Is it all to the same place or is these like I'm in my office and I have to send a letter to Mr. Jones and I put it in the mailbox and you handle that mail. But you we don't handle like um, big mailings that someone generates of 300 people. Yes, we do. You do both? Yes. And um, when you do the latter, um, are you mailing at bulk rate or are you mailing it for 47 cents? We have a Whatever discounted rate for the amount of mail that we go out through our mail machine. It's not a, a huge discount. Um, it's, I think we save about five cents a letter. I think with, um, I'll, I'll ask the accounts committee to maybe put on a resolve to talk about potentially maybe getting a mail house in. Because you can get bulk rate for anything over 150 pieces now. We can talk about it. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor. Any other questions relative to mailroom? Seeing none, we're moving on. Out of the telephone. Anything for the auditor relative to telephone? Seeing none, we're moving on. Retirement non-contributory auditor. Any questions, councilors, relative to that? Seeing none, we're moving on. We're done with that agenda item. Thank you, Ms. Auditor. <laughs> councilors, I want to thank you. Tonight was a long night. The first night is always uh, uh, a longer night because we kind of get, a, get our feet wet. But I want to thank each and every one of you. I think the questions you asked tonight were uh, respectful and I think they were on point and we'll be here tomorrow night and uh, the council uh, agenda for FinCom relative to the budget will start at 6.30. Were we meeting at 6 o'clock tomorrow night? Did we get 6.30. Notice? Did we get notice for 6 o'clock tomorrow night um, for the clerk? We got an oh. agenda, but I don't, I, I don't know. 6.30. Okay. We've, we do, got an email. point of information. We do, we do need to uh, at some point meet for a couple minutes because we do this every year. The revolving funds have to be sent out to a finance committee meeting. Uh, they, they need that it needs to happen and it didn't happen at the last city council meeting so we will be meeting I I thought it was tomorrow night but if not we'll be meeting soon so um, with that the meetings adjourned have a good night drive careful